expose everything, you won't admit it. And action. This entire video is based on a true story. When I do like motivational speeches or even tell myself like, love yourself and you should love yourself. This is Lily Singh. But to fans all over the world, she's the YouTube star, Superwoman. What up everyone, it's a girl, Superwoman. I know we can change the world for the better one positive day at a time. My parents now know what I do. <laughs> they didn't know what I did for a long time in the beginning of my career. I was just making videos in my room, they had no idea. Mom, Dad, have you seen my keys? I can't find them anywhere. Because you're always on phone. Until someone called them, like a family member from another part of Canada was like, Canada, is your daughter making videos? And I think my mom was like, I don't, I don't know, Lily, oh, Lily, are you making videos? <laughs> Just making videos grew into an entire career. Today, Lily's YouTube channel has some 12 million subscribers, over 2 billion views, and guest stars like Michelle Obama, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, and Seth Rogen. I think a lot of young girls are raised to believe that you're going to go to school and then graduate and then get married and then get a job and have kids. And Lily was on that path, all the way through a psychology degree at York University in Toronto. But when she started thinking about a career... I started to immensely panic and think something was wrong with me because I tried to figure out my life and it wasn't working in that straight line. It was 2010 and YouTube was only five years old. I thought nothing of YouTube. I, I was probably the last person in my circle of friends to discover YouTube. And I remember when I did, I thought, this is so strange. There's people making videos in their rooms and other people are watching them. So she figured, why not give it a shot? I one day posted a video because I was sad and I wanted to be creative and happy. She didn't know how to edit video or write scripts, so she winged it. It was so bad and so cringe, and my expectation was literally nothing. I was like, I'm gonna put this video up, a couple of my friends are gonna watch it, probably make fun of me, and that's gonna be the end of this. The second and third video came from, wait, 70 people watched my first one, can I get 80 to watch the next one? She kept creating, she kept posting, and the viewers kept coming. Lily had found an audience. A lot of the comments were, oh my God, there's a brown girl on YouTube. More specifically, Indian. Lily's parents immigrated to Canada from India, and Lily was born and raised in Scarborough, near Toronto. My home life was awesome. My parents, even though I portrayed them to be quite strict in my videos. Oh, Lily, where the rest of your skirt, huh? I teach you like this, to walk around like this, showing everything to everyone. They actually aren't like that at all. They're pretty modern and pretty cool. Your dress is short. Don't know what for. And we're pretty lenient with me. I mean, I got to, I got away with a lot of things. I was a brat. This is this is. The, I was a brat. She had a different idea of what she wanted out of life than other kids. In a grade school graduation slideshow, her classmates said they wanted to be lawyers and doctors. And then I came up and I was like rapper. Looking out with your friends, man. Yeah. But then you say that you hate hoes. I could just feel my parents being like, why? <laughs> Because that's just not something women really did in the Singh family. I know there was a ton of people that weren't happy about my birth being a female, so I think, and that's some real-ish, but it's, it's, it's a real thing. The best thing I could have done to prove to so many people that didn't want my mom to have a daughter was to become Superwoman. What up everyone, it's your girl, Superwoman. It was the name of Lily's favorite hip hop song by Lil Mo featuring Fabulous. I love the song so much because it was one of the only songs of the time that was an empowering female song where Lil Mo's going on about like, I will save guys with my superpowers and I will save girls with my superpowers and I am the superwoman. I thought, this name that I've had for so long that empowered me when I was younger, I'm gonna make this my screen name. Maybe this should be a new series. Superwoman didn't just burst onto the scene overnight with a viral video. It was a steady climb fueled by hard work. The moment that I thought this is going somewhere and this could be a career was the first time I performed internationally. It was in India. And it was the first time where I was truly across the world and people knew my videos. Singh has transformed herself from a bratty kid to an internet personality to a media mogul. She starred in a feature film, A Trip to Unicorn Island, in 2016. And her book, How to Be a Boss, hit the New York Times bestseller list in 2017 while she was on a 30-city international tour. Lily started out with the goal of getting millions of subscribers and financial security. Hurry the hell up! But after surpassing those goals, success has new meaning. I really come to terms with the fact that my, my definition of success is what's the best legacy I can leave behind. And it's not the number of views, the number of subscribers. It is the number of people that can say, this girl changed my life or changed something in my life positively.
PTSD is often found in the brains of deceased athletes, military veterans, and others with a history of repetitive brain trauma. Hundreds have donated their brains to the VA Boston University Concussion Legacy Foundation Brain Bank. This is a former NFL player who died in his early 70s. And this is a, a veteran uh, who also died in his early 70s. Dr. Ann McKee dissects these brains. The hippocampus and the mammillary bodies are very important for memory. I can see that they're slightly affected. McKee recently dissected the brain of former New England Patriots player Aaron Hernandez, who was convicted of murder and later committed suicide. You'll see right away that the brain is showing signs of shrinkage. You can see the crevices in the brain that you can't in the normal. McKee says Hernandez's severe case of CTE impacted his decision-making, depression, and ability to control rage and aggression. Right now, she thinks we're underestimating how many people have CTE. We were able to distinguish between CTE and controls and CTE and Alzheimer's disease. The next question is, can we do this in the blood and can we do this in living people? And we aren't there yet with those answers. But the need for a diagnosis in the living is motivating companies such as Quanterix in Lexington, Massachusetts, to work faster on technology that could diagnose concussions and CTE in as few as 30 minutes. Kevin Rosovsky is the CEO. It's like a high-powered microscope. And so by doing that, we can see little biomarkers that you couldn't see before in the blood. Quanterix received a grant from the NFL and just went public. Since then, its stock is up more than 40%. The company sells a machine called Samoa for $175,000 to other biotechs, hospitals, and researchers. And for the first time in history, we're able to see brain health in blood, and that's a major breakthrough, and that's leading to less invasive testing, and we've already been able to see evidence of concussions, and there's the beginning evidence of being able to see the accumulated effect of concussions. Quanterix is also trying to detect Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, and ALS. Rosovsky says he thinks diagnosing concussions will be easier than diagnosing CTE. Diagnosing CT in the living probably is a couple years away. We're real excited to see the progress, but reducing some of that work into actual tests in a laboratory takes time. There's regulatory approvals. There's a lot of um, red tape that you have to go through. Also in this race to diagnose CTE in the blood are Athlon Medical and Exosome Sciences. And New York's Mount Sinai Hospital is scanning for the disease in the living. But it's just one step in a series of questions for those with serious head trauma. There's still no cure for CTE. Even if we had a great idea for a treatment, there's no way to test if whether it's effective or not. So that's the enormous advance that we'll get if we can develop a biomarker for this disease. In Boston and Mostu, Bloomberg News.
Wine is a $300 billion global industry where one person's opinion can make fortunes or break them. That's because of this man, Robert Parker, and his newsletter, The Wine Advocate. For three decades, he dominated as the world's most influential wine critic. Now Parker's protege is building an empire of his own. Antonio Galloni runs Venice. Antonio, tell me, what are you trying to build at Venice? Well, at Venice, we started with the idea uh, in 2013 of building a world-class platform. We have a database of about 250,000 professionally written reviews. On Delectable, we have 7 million user reviews. De through Delectable, we also have a partnership with Whole Foods and several other partnerships that we can't announce just yet. And when you put that all together, what we have is something that no other company in our space can even come close to. Do you think of yourself as the next Parker? Not at all. Why? Uh, because Steve Jobs said you can't live your life trying to be somebody else. So that, he's one of my biggest influences, and I've never wanted to be a replica of somebody else because a replica is never as good as the original. Bob is a, a genius, fantastic, one of a kind. Um, we're going to be something completely different, and I have no, no desire to be some version of somebody else. Different in what way? Um, every decision that I've made at this company is completely <laughs> anathemic to what Bob did with his company. Um, I want our writers to be partners. All of my senior people are locked into the company. They all have equity or they have a path to equity based on business results. That's something that we never had at Parker. Our, our benefits are world class uh, and everything that we've done at Venice is completely different from that model. When Steve Tanzer, who is the most experienced active wine critic in America, wants to work with us, that says something. When Alessandro Masnaghetti, who's the best cartographer of wine vi of, of vineyards, wants to work with us, that says something. When Neil Martin, who's a superstar wine critic with enormous experience in Bordeaux and Burgundy and the former lead critic at The Advocate, wants to come and be part of our team, that says something. You make it sound like The Wine Advocate was a disaster as a company and a miserable experience as an employee. No, it was, it was great because I got to work with Bob Parker when he was at his prime. You know, and Bob was like a second father to me, and we talked on the phone all the time, and he gave me great advice. Can anyone's palate dominate the wine criticism business the way Parker's did? And should anyone's palate dominate it the way his did? I just think the world is very different today. You know, the, I mean, it's just a totally different world. It's probably not healthy to have a single person dominating the world. The, the, it's not even wine criticism, it's the wine industry. Yeah, it's prob that's probably not the healthiest thing in the world. Um, but I think that there's just such an opportunity right now with social media and technology to reach such a massive number of people that I think it's possible that one or two people will actually have more influence than Bob Parker did. Because they will, they will again, this goes back to your first question, not trying to be a version of somebody else. You see this in sports all the time. It's like, oh, well, nobody will ever beat this record. And then somebody comes along. You know, it was like tennis, Pete Sampras. Nobody's ever going to win as many Grand Slams. I have two guys who are ahead of that and one knocking on the door. And, and so I think a lot like that. You're a former investment banker. How does that inform and influence what you're doing and what you've done? My generation has had to deal with a lot more challenges. That's why I think we're actually much better poised for the future. My first job in finance, the first thing that happened was long-term capital, 1998. <laughs> then the tech bubble melted down. Then there was a uh, mutual fund trading scandal. You know, that was all like within about five or six years. And these are the things that I had to deal with as a young executive. My peers who were 20 years older didn't know how to manage in crisis. They'd only seen Black Monday. They'd just been in a big bull market. It's very different. So I, I'm very lucky. People of my generation or a little bit younger have actually had to deal with a lot more crises. I think that's actually good for learning how to cope with challenges in business. From the outside, it kind of looks like you're trying to demolish the house that Parker built, right? You left the wine advocate. Yeah. You merged with one of his chief rivals. Yeah. And you just hired his successor, Neil Martin. Mm -hmm. So are you? I think what that says is that all the best people want to work at our company. And that's really what we strive to create starting in 2013. We wanted to create a world-class company that would attract the best in class talent, and not just on the content side, on the technology side, on the digital side, our office, and at every level, what we're trying to, we only hire superstars, and we're looking for those superstars.
In the world of professional wrestling, there's something called a swerve. Hulk Hogan has betrayed WCW! Some examples. These tag team partners are called baby faces, or the good guys. Then one of them swerves when he super kicks his tag team partner in the head, quickly assuming the role of the bad guy, or what the wrestling world calls the heel. Are you kidding? What a despicable act that was! Or a match is almost lost when, what's that? The superstar wrestler appears out of nowhere sprinting down the aisle to save the match. That's the music. It's the That's a swerve. So it should go as no surprise that World Wrestling Entertainment, known as the WWE, the most popular brand of sports entertainment in the world, is prepared for any swerves that come their way. So here's the story of how the WWE learned to see the swerve coming. So I spoke to Bloomberg reporters Felix Gillette. I'm a writer for Bloomberg News for the Global Business Team. And Kim Basin. And I'm the U.S. luxury reporter at Bloomberg. To find out exactly how the WWE is positioning itself for an all-out global invasion, which starts with a massive change to their lucrative pay-per-view model. WWE basically pioneered the pay-per-view model on cable. I remember as a kid, when the pay-per-view events came up, all of our friends would scramble around and try and get one of the parents to pay for it. But in 2014, they took a huge risk. They saw a little bit sooner than some of the other entertainment brands that where this whole thing was moving was away from cable and satellite television and towards on-demand streaming video apps. They made this risky decision, in essence, cannibalizing that pay-per-view which they had essentially built. And after some early turbulence, it's working. Roughly 1.5 million people are paying $9.99 a month for the WWE app, making it the fifth most popular streaming OTT service. This adapt-or-die approach is in the WWE's DNA. Over the past 30 years, the company always seems to think two steps ahead. In the early 90s, WWE was at its most threatened when Ted Turner took them on with WCW, which stands for World Championship Wrestling. And back then, the WCW was winning the ratings war. So in order to compete with them, WWE had changed its product from a family-friendly kind of cartoonish to this really raw. That's why they called their show Raw. It was this raw style of, of, of wrestling with violent, outrageous, reality-inspired plot lines and aggressive personas. From a 16-foot ladder! And they won that fight against Ted Turner. They bought WCW. The early 2000s ushered in an era of testosterone-driven programming aimed at the red-blooded American male. Bra and panties matches and people smash each other over their head with, with like, barbed wire bats and things like that. Until 2015, when WWE fans started a hashtag, Give Divas a Chance. Since then, WWE has hired 40 more female wrestlers, and that growing cast of female characters was part of a much larger plan. They started to uh, try to appeal to a broader people. Let's attract more female fans. And after we've attracted more female fans, let's attract more international fans. They're broadening their base, and they're doing that in large part to make it more advertising friendly. And not just friendly to advertisers. They're trying to build up their fan base in China. They're trying to build up their fan base in Europe. They, you know, already have a pretty good fan base in India. India is a place where they all have an established wrestling culture because of the gigantic Indian wrestler, the great Kali. But there's still a lot of work to do. While the WWE set a revenue record in 2017, only 30% of it is coming from an overseas audience. And there's one person whose responsibility is to grow that number. The buck eventually stops at Vince McMahon, no matter what's happening within WWE. Yeah, he's a very controlling guy, and it's a very, very, very tightly scripted company. And that goes all the way down the board to the big stars' entrance music. <laughs> and their, their outfits and things like that. So with a CEO like McMahon always planning two moves ahead and an aggressive push into multiple international markets, a big issue is money. It's hard to do all those things simultaneously without committing a huge amount of capital to it. And that's where the WWE becomes an attractive company for buyers. Potentially, one thing that could happen with WWE is they could benefit 
by being acquired by a bigger technology or telecom company, an Amazon or Facebook or a 21st Century Fox. So with a market cap of $2.8 billion, the advantage of owning 100% of their own content and a rapid consolidation spreading throughout the entertainment industry, it looks like the WWE is well positioned, even if there are swerves. Our world is changing. Every day, it changes a little faster. Some changes are too small to see. Others, too big to handle. Sometimes, change feels slow. So slow, we don't even notice. Other times, it happens all at once. And we can't keep up. For our climate, change means many things. And between too small to see and too big to handle, there is a whole world of difference. The clock is ticking. This is Bloomberg Green. Saving the seas. This week, the deep sea diver who stopped riding the ocean's obituary to find a solution. And Rick Sala tells us why the next 10 years matter most. And globalization needs to get greener. Shipping accounts for nearly an eighth of all transport emissions. How can the industry clean up its act? Plus, protecting coastlines comes at a huge environmental cost. But one Israeli startup found a way to keep the sea out and the animals in. From London, I'm Anne-Marie Hordern, and this is Bloomberg Green. After more than a decade of studying the ocean as an academic, Enric Sala realized he was writing the ocean's obituary. He quit his job and became a full-time conservationist. As an in-house explorer for National Geographic, he's clocked more than 5,000 open water dives. He's also founded Pristine Seas, a project that combines exploration, research, and media to lobby countries to protect their oceans. To date, it has helped create marine reserves equivalent to half the size of Canada. I spoke to him about his mission and why it's so urgent. The state of the world's oceans is really bad. We have lost 90% of the large fish in the ocean. Sharks, groupers, cod, tuna. More than half of the fish stocks are overfished, which means that we are taking them out of the water faster than they can reproduce. More than half of the ocean is affected by industrial fishing and global warming is killing coral reefs all around the world. The ocean is in a trajectory of decline. Can you just visualize for our viewers who never get to see the kind of things you are able to see, what an ocean and healthy ecosystem looks like versus one that's next to a bustling economic and industrialized area? Coral reefs in the United States, in the Florida Keys, are down to only 2% of what they used to be. Before, 80 to 90% of the bottom on a coral reef in the Caribbean was covered by live coral. Now, Florida Keys have only 2%. The average in the Caribbean is about 5% of the bottom covered by live coral. The rest is covered by slime. Very rare that if you jump into any place in the Caribbean at random, you see a shark. It's very, very rare. Now, let's go to Millennium Atoll, for example. An atoll that is uninhabited and fished south of the equator in the Central Pacific belongs to the Republic of Kiribati. 2009, we conducted the first, the first underwater expedition to this island, and I still remember the first time. Jumped over the side of the boat, and as soon as the bubbles cleared, was surrounded by 15 gray reef sharks. After a couple minutes, the shark decided that we were boring and they went back to do their thing. And you look down, 90% of the seafloor is covered by thriving coral. And it's full of fish and a sea turtle comes by. Now this abundance that we rarely see anywhere except in well-managed marine reserves. This is what the ocean used to be like, and this is what we have learned from going to these pristine places. And you write in your book that you're writing the obituary of ocean life. What's the cure? The cure is doing less harm. Basically, there are three things that we are doing to the ocean. One is we are taking fish out of the water faster than they can reproduce. Two, we are turning the ocean warmer and more acidic because of man-made climate change. And three, we are throwing in everything that we don't want, our waste and our plastic. We need basically to reverse these trends. Does this mean that a lot of this falls to 
governments and their policies? That's a big part of it because it is governments that regulate fishing and mineral extraction and oil extraction. It is governments that have the legal authority to create large marine reserves in the ocean. But also local communities have an important role to play because some of the most successful protected areas in the ocean are community-led and community-managed marine reserves. So when the fish come back, the divers come in. And that creates huge economic opportunities through ecotourism. These areas that are managed by communities are very successful because the communities have a vested interest in having as many fish as possible inside them so they can enjoy the benefits. What from the pandemic has changed your view when it comes to protection of the environment? Nature has given us a very strong signal of how fast it can recover if we just give it space. Everybody was fascinated by all these videos of the whales and the dolphins coming into marinas and mountain lions on the streets of Santiago in Chile, wild goats in the UK. Nature has this extraordinary ability to bounce back if we just give it space. This is why we need to protect at least 30% of the planet by 2030. How do healthy marine ecosystems help in the fight against climate change, though? Most people see it. the ocean as a victim of climate change, but the ocean can also be a solution because we know that the more life that is in the ocean, like big fish and big whales, the more these organisms help to make the ocean productive and absorb more CO2. The kelp forests, seagrass beds, all of these are important ecosystems in the ocean that are similar to the forests on the land that capture a lot of our carbon pollution. What are you most excited about in your field? We have 10 years to fix this problem. Global fisheries catch is going down, the stocks are collapsing. Business as usual means that by 2050, 90% of the coral reefs are gone, that most commercial fisheries have collapsed. That affects food security, that affects a migration of people. We have 10 years to get to peak greenhouse gas emissions and then go carbon neutral by 2050. And we have 10 years to protect at least 30% of the ocean so we can restore much of this health and productivity not just for saving biodiversity, but also saving our life support system. We are not talking about something that is apart from us. We are not apart from nature. We are a part of nature. So these 10 years are probably the most critical in the history of humanity. The most accurate measurements of changing oceans will come from space. While Enric Sala explores what lies beneath, a new satellite is giving us data from above. We'll learn more about our oceans and climate change, but from space. A new satellite's been launched from California. Its mission, track the accelerating rise of sea levels. Well, the main instruments on board uh, include a dual-frequency radar altimeter. And this is the primary instrument of the mission, and that's the one that's measuring sea surface height, significant wave height, and wind speed over the ocean. And from those measurements, we can actually have uh, the superb measurements that we expect um, of sea level rise. Data gathered from Sentinel-6 will be used alongside information from other satellites to build as complete a picture of the oceans as possible. With a, a, a long record, we can precisely uh, measure the acceleration. We eventually can detect new regime, tipping points, for example, if there is a runaway in the melting of Greenland or Antarctica, sea level uh, will uh, record this uh, runaway change uh, because it is an integrator of all changes that are occurring in the, in the climate system. So we, we will be able to see some, some change, big change, in, uh, in the global climate. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration expects that sea level rise will increasingly threaten U.S. coastlines. One example, the southern tip of Manhattan is expected to flood 20 to 40 times a year by 2030. 11 uh, of the 15 largest megacities are located at the coast, and this number will double, and, um, I mean, the, the number of... Um, people living in, in coastal area will double in, by uh, 2060. So uh, it, knowing how much sea level is rising at the coast and how much it will rise in the future uh, in coastal areas is as uh, obvious. Uh, it, it's obviously a major goal uh, for, for human beings. 
coming up from sales to steam to oil, the shipping industry is no stranger to change. But how will it navigate the next transition? This is Bloomberg Green. From Bloomberg's European headquarters in London, I'm Anne-Marie Hordern. This is Bloomberg Green. Now for your roundup of this week's latest climate news, Jennifer Zabazaja has your Green in Brief. Here's the climate news you need to know. Deforestation of the world's largest rainforest has hit a 12-year high. More than 4,000 square miles of the Amazon rainforest was destroyed in 2020. That's a 9.5% increase from a year earlier. Government data shows that destruction has soared since President Jair Bolsonaro took office and weakened environmental enforcement. The Amazon is home to millions of species and plants and is critical in the fight against climate change. Bitcoin is hitting all-time highs, but at what cost to the environment? The cryptocurrency is energy intensive and there are concerns if it becomes mainstream. According to MIT, back in 2018, Bitcoin's carbon footprint was almost as big as Portugal's. Want to get better at tackling climate change? We'll hire more women. That's according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Firms with 30% or more women in top jobs tend to perform better when it comes to the environment and are more likely to set clear climate goals. Shopping online is more popular than ever now, but the price of convenience is measured in CO2, and more deliveries means more fuel burned and more packaging wasted. So what can companies do? Well, many are becoming more efficient and sourcing more clean energy for their data centers and warehouses. And England's farmers will be paid to go green after Brexit. As European subsidies are phased out, they'll get new money to encourage them to produce healthy, sustainable food. Poor farming practices are one of the leading drivers of water pollution and the loss of biodiversity. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja in New York. Anne-Marie, back to you. The shipping industry is more than just the grease on the wheels of globalization. It's its chief enabler. 11 billion tons of goods are transported by ship each year. The biggest contributors being 2 billion tons of oil, 1 billion tons of iron ore, and 350 million tons of grain. According to the International Chamber of Shipping, 80% of Europe's imports and exports happen over the seas. And for such a vast industry, it also contributes its fair share of emissions. Shipping makes up 12% of global transport energy consumption. So how does it clean up its act? Earlier, I caught up with Bloomberg Green reporter Laura Milan about just how big of a challenge this is going to be for the industry. 
one of the main issues is size. So um, about 90% of the world's cargo is moved by ships. So obviously changing such a huge uh, industry is not going to be fast and it's not going to be easy. The second issue is uh, has to do with technology. So uh, ships obviously uh, travel for many days at sea. It's not as easy for them to refuel as it would be for a car, for example, going on a road. And the sector still hasn't found a technology that's economically viable and that uh, zero emissions and equivalent to, to the electric batteries for cars, for example. But actions are being put in place to make the industry a bit more environmentally friendly. Walk us through those steps that they're taking. That's it. So um, there's a, a first step that would involve uh, using low emission fuels or uh, biofuels that would significantly reduce the existing emissions. And then at a regulatory level, when it comes to the policy and the governments, there are steps being made as well. I would say that the most significant ones come from the European Union, which started to track emissions a few years ago and is now looking to include shipping emissions in the emissions trading system system. So that would significantly reduce and, and help calculate uh, the emissions from the shipping industry. Now, uh, China is taking similar steps. So at the moment, regions need to report shipping emissions to the central government. And finally, we have the International Maritime Organization with a pledge to reduce uh, shipping emissions by 50% in 2050. Now, we must say that that pledge uh, has been considered insufficient by environmental groups, but at least some steps are being taken. So to get to 2050, the industry obviously is going to need to start tapping some new technologies. What new technologies are you seeing being introduced into the shipping industry? So we have seen pilot technologies being developed for years now, but what's interesting about this current moment is that we're seeing big players invest uh, in these technologies that are not yet economically viable, but then one day might be. So for example, we are seeing uh, earlier this year the world's largest agricultural commodities trader, Cargill, saying they will invest in attaching sails to their ships uh, so they can make any technology that they run their ships on more efficient. Similarly, we have seen a spin-off of Airbus, the aeronautics company, developing a similar application with kites. We have been following also developments in hydrogen. So at the moment, hydrogen fuel seems like a good option, a, a possible option when, when it has been uh, developed and when it becomes uh, economically viable. And we have Vestas, for example, the world's largest uh, turbine maker, developing some ships that will be able to run on hydrogen in the near future. Coming up, rising sea levels means humans need to get creative when it comes to coastal defenses. But how do we protect both ourselves and the environment? One Israeli startup may have the answer. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg Green. London, I'm Anne-Marie Hordern. This is Bloomberg Green. After water, what's the resource that humans use the most? It's concrete, three tons a year for every person on the planet. And engineers estimate it's used twice as much as all other building materials combined. And it comes with a huge environmental cost. Concrete, not just in cities, it's a common feature on our coastlines too. And that's taking a toll on biodiversity. But one Israeli startup has found a way of making sea defenses stronger and encouraging life to thrive. If you take a look at concrete structures like breakwaters or seawalls, the water around them is often clear. That's not actually a good thing because it means there's no life. 
marine species are actually most abundant in coastal areas, but it's also where us humans prefer to live too. So when we build here, we drive away marine life. The concrete in the marine world has a lot of additives, a lot of chemicals, and some of those materials are actually leaching out and they're actually prohibiting marine life to thrive. We keep developing without any regards to natural communities. There is a tilting point uh, from which beyond we cannot really go back. In the coastal city of Tel Aviv, an Israeli startup wants to revolutionize our urban coastlines. Their sea defenses are transforming lifeless man made structures into teeming ecosystems. They do this by replacing standard concrete with their own special cement formulas. As opposed to regular cement-based concrete, e-concrete includes certain elements uh, that enhance the growth of marine flora and fauna of plants and animals. Our admix, which is kind of our secret sauce, is basically kind of sealing the concrete, making it less aggressive for the marine environment. That once we add it, we enable life to flourish. In the lab, the team run tests to identify what mixes will work best for marine life. So we take really ice cube sized concrete slabs of different compositions and we put larvae, 20, 30, 50. We need to have a lot of replicates. We are geeky scientists, so we have to have a lot of replication and controls. And then within a few days or just a few weeks, we can get an answer on uh, their preference. So obviously if they die, they have a very low tolerance to that specific concrete mix design. And if they thrive or they flourish, we can quantify that uh, very quickly. E-concrete says it typically sees double the biodiversity of regular grey concrete. From fish and sea caterpillars on their armour blocks to crabs on these tidal pools that sit on the shoreline. This unit holds water uh, during the low tide, so it's always moist. And therefore it has um, a very comfortable habitat for uh, crabs and sea anemones and sea stars, etc. These pools have been here for less than three months. And this is already what you can see. It's covered with life see the rock around it, which has been here for probably 10, 20, maybe even more years, only has a thin layer of green algae and that's it. As well as the composition of the cement mix, E-Concrete designs its products specifically to the marine environment it will be deployed. To create niches for endangered species or to develop nurseries like these oyster beds. The final part of the equation is creating complex surface textures to mimic natural rock or coral an environment that helps anchor young organisms. When concrete elements are being cast, the typical goal is to have a very slick uh, surface, very, very smooth. The idea is to get the water to flow right across it. When we're designing e-concrete with a rough surface, we want to do the complete opposite. We want to slow the water when they are crossing the structure so that the larvae can actually adhere uh, and attach to the surface. Concrete has to offer its clients more than just ecological credentials. Over time, they've discovered that creating hospitable habitats for marine life adds another advantage, one that is surely hard to ignore. We've seen evidence to the fact that the growth of the organisms on the concrete create kind of a layer of defense. Just the addition of weight, we can actually gain stability and strength over time. This is the, let's say, the, the unit when we put it in the water. And this is after a year in the water. And what you can see here is all the oysters are completely covering it. We designed the units so they can withstand the forces and perform in terms of structural performance, but they can also be a backbone for uh, ecological enhancement. The company tests its miniature designs in tanks full of real seawater, rocks, plants, and animal life from around the world. What we're looking for is the accumulation of calcium carbonate on the surface of the concrete of, by, of different mixes and different designs. This is the process that we call it biogenic buildup. So with time, we get a buildup of calcium carbonate that is sourced from marine organisms on the surface of the concrete. And we actually encapsulate the concrete with a natural rock. So when the organism die, in case of a coral, it will die and then another coral will sit on it and that's how a reef is growing. The hope that our man-made structures could become stronger over time also means better economics. 
The units require less maintenance and could therefore stay in the water for longer. E-concrete though is just a few years old, so it needs more time to really quantify the longevity of its products. But the company are certain their products are better for the environment, and not just in terms of improving biodiversity. We're kind of trying to offset some of that immense carbon footprint of the concrete industry. Construction is responsible for about 11% of global carbon emissions. By adding a biological crust to their products, e-concrete prevents some CO2 from being released into the atmosphere. For every kilogram of uh, calcium carbonate being created by those marine organisms, we're offsetting 120 grams of CO2. So think about building a port infrastructure or a city waterfront that is an active carbon sink. I think that's a great advantage of the technology. That does it for this week, but let's keep the conversation going on Twitter. Follow us at Climate. I'm Anne-Marie Hordern, and this is Bloomberg Green. Business Week. Inside from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine, plus global business, finance, and tech news as it happens. Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Bloomberg Quick Takes Tim Stenovic on Bloomberg Radio. Yes, indeed. Live from our Bloomberg Interactive Brokers Studio, streaming on YouTube. It is Tuesday, March 2nd, 2021. What goes up must go down and maybe go up again, Tim. <laughs> uh, that seems to be the theme of the last, uh, well, let's say six or seven days, trading that, days, that is. That makes a market, right? Yeah. Uh, we're definitely seeing that. Uh, again, worries about steep valuations. We're going to talk, though, about one well-known investor in that higher valuation space seeing near record fund inflows. None other than Kathy Wood of ARK Invest. Yeah, so we're going to talk about that. And also talk about another Goldman senior executive saying, bye bye it's our most read story on the Bloomberg. Uh, that one crossed today, and a colleague of mine said, what is going on at Goldman? Yeah, well, we're going to have some answers. All right, lots to get to over the next three hours. Let's get you going, though, on this Tuesday with a check on your top business stories. Here is Doug Krisner. All right. Oh, Doug. John Tucker. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm never going to get this right. How They're long all... do we go back? <laughs> and you've already forgotten. They're all mad at me. Day yes. two, here we go. <laughs> S&P 500, Carol, fluctuating. Gains in commodity producers and banks offsetting a slide in the uh, technology companies today. You have uh, Apple, Microsoft, Tesla dragging down the Nasdaq 100 with the Dow Jones Industrial Average outperforming today. Uh, bonds, they are a little changed. Here's a quote on the 10 year yield right now, 141. Dow Jones Industrial Average is up 36 points. The SP 500 
down about two points right now. The Nasdaq Composite Index, 92 points lower. That is down seven tenths of a percent. We're at 13,497. Did get some Fed speak. Uh, Federal Reserve Governor Leo Brainerd says it's going to take some time to meet the conditions laid out by the U.S. Central Bank for reducing the pace of its massive bond purchases. Well, this comes in remarks prepared for a, a virtual speech to the Council on Foreign Relations. And that is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Carol and Tim. Don't Thank hate you. me. Don't hate me, John Tucker. The rest of the, I feel like I the, rest of the newsroom Tim. hates me right now. You know, that's just how I, I could never forget you. <laughs> All right, John Tucker, we always appreciate when John Tucker sticks around for us. All right, it is time now for the Market Drivers Report. All right, let's set the Bloomberg Business Week agenda. And with that is Dave Wilson, Stocks Editor at Bloomberg News, on the remote access from New Jersey. Eric Valchunas, Senior ETF Analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. He's on the phone in New Jersey. But Dave, we're going to start with you. Talk about the trade because it's up, down, up. It's, you know, a little volatility today. Yeah, a little is the key. I mean, not a whole lot of direction, especially after yesterday when stocks looked like they were headed straight up. It's like we're stalling out close to records, whether you look at the Dow Industrials or the S&P 500. NASDAQ uh, a little bit further away from its peak, but nonetheless uh, kind of struggling for direction a bit here. And, you know, we've kind of gotten to the point where, you know, we're, we're toward the end of fourth quarter results. And, you know, it's a matter of what kind of gets things going from here. I mean, clearly having uh, the uh, third coronavirus vaccine from Johnson & Johnson helps. But, you know, now that's sort of you know, built in. So it's a matter of, you know, what's next here. And, uh, you know, just not enough to kind of push the, the broader indexes sort of off neutral, you might say, though, if you look at some of the travel stocks, notably the uh, cruise lines. Uh, they're having a pretty good day today. All right, Dave. Um, so good to know. I'm going to just go right to Eric because there's a story that caught our attention, and I feel like I like to watch fun flows in terms of where investor money uh, goes. Go back years on Bloomberg. We used to do money flow, those big block trades to kind of get an idea of investor sentiment. Eric Balchunas, you follow the ETF market. You follow, safe to say, kind of one of the biggest names in ETFs right now is Kathy Wood. She was on our air last week. Um we're watching the flows in and out of her big funds, particularly her flagship fund. Yeah, of course. Uh, this has been one of the biggest stories of the last two years. Um, ARKK is the flagship fund, as you say, and it saw $465 million come in yesterday. And what's interesting about that flow is she reports with one-day lag. So that inflow came really from Friday's action. And if you know, uh, the, R the ETF was about flat on Friday, mm -hmm. and it had just come off the heels of a 15% drop in that, that week. And so that tells you that there was a lot of dip buying ready to pop in. So there's this, I don't know, crowd of haters that are just thinking there's going to be some kind of a run on her ETF as soon as it uh, stumbles a little bit. But we've looked and followed her for five years, and I'm telling you, every time she has a little bit of a stumble performance-wise, the flows come right back, um, and I would not. I would expect to see this pattern go on. You probably will. You know, as it gets more mature, the flows could just be bigger in size. Could be like 300 out one day, 400 in. But this is the kind of tug of war we expect to see, barring a you know three month nasty you know kind of crash in the market. But these little sell offs, I, I would expect a little inflows, little outflows uh, for the foreseeable future. When you say something, you know that would be extended, like a couple months of a choppy market. What does that look like for for ARKK? Yeah, so you could have a, you could have one of the a horrible months, and ARKK will stop probably still be tripling the S and P. It has a lot of room to give. Uh, it's interesting; they have a fifteen percent drop in that week, and you know it's just it's like an athlete who's like the top scorer like every single game for eighty games, and then the eighty mm -hmm. first game they. They uh, don't do that well. You really have to look at the whole picture. She could fall. That fund could fall a lot, and it probably will. I mean, she's been out there saying, you should expect corrections in my fund. It's high growth. I mean, what do you expect? She and that's smart. I would get right ahead of that and own that and just say, but here's the thing. We're going five years uh, out, and that's a smart way to position this is I'm long-term. We will have corrections, and therefore nobody can say, well, you, you misled me. 
Well, listen, and that's exactly what she told us. Nothing goes up in a, in a straight line. And I feel like it's like Tom Brady having an off week. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, in the long run, Tom Brady's done just fine. Eric, right. when you know, you've been following ETFs for, for quite a while. You follow them closely. How atypical is what we've seen with with flows in, in, in Kathy Wood's funder? Is this what you see when there is a, a fund that does this well? Yeah, it's it's probably something like one in five hundred thousand. Wow. Um, that's just my gut guess on this because look, she came into the market high cost, stock picking, and indie. Not not a lot of distribution. Being one of those three things makes your life a living hell in the ETF industry. It's brutal. She's all three, and mm-hmm. she was able to do this. And how she did it was a she went she swung for the fences. She was very concentrated. And I think she understood that, A, the GIC sectors were limiting. This, she's allowed to go across sectors to find innovation. And sometimes the tech sector, you don't get, say, an Amazon, right? So she's able to be free from that. Um, also, I think that concentration, she was foreseeing the way the portfolios are changing. Um, we, there's, it's barbelling. So you have a cheap beta core. And then, of course, you want to do something exciting on the outer layer. And that's the middle is the hard place to be right now. And that's where active traditionally goes. They just try to make a few little bets, but she's going for the fences and she hit a home run that went over the stadium. That obviously the performance helped, but her whole attitude is just very modern. It's transparent. People like following her. It's social. So she's more than just a return. She's sort of just tapping into what people are, how they are, are reacting emotionally uh, using the internet to uh, to active management. So I think that active can learn a lot from her. That said, this probably won't last forever. This reminds us of currency hedge craze about yeah. seven years ago, the Janus 20. Right. History is littered with these high flyers. Right, right. Dave, your thoughts on high flyers? We've certainly seen our fair share of them over time, and uh, they do have a way of kind of crashing and burning on occasion. And, uh, you know, the real question is whether uh, what we're seeing with ARC is uh, going to follow the model, uh, you know, even going back to the 90s when Internet stocks were all the rage. Right, right. All right, great stuff, guys. Thank you so much. Dave's going to be along a little bit later on with his chart and stock of the day. Eric Balchunas, thank you so much. Senior ETF analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. Check him out at Twitter at Eric Balchunas. And, of course, Dave is at the one Dave. Let's do the Bloomberg Business Week by of the day one number that tells us a lot, $2 billion. Zoom's upbeat revenue forecast sends shares of the company surging. For its founder, that translates into a $2 billion wealth bump. Eric Yuan, who owns almost one-fifth of the video conferencing company, now worth about $22 billion. That's according to the Bloomberg Billionaires Index. Yeah, we saw that stock moving big time. Right now it's down about 5%, but nonetheless... Uh, it has been kind of, I feel like, one of the ultimate pandemic plays. Yeah, and people still bullish on it, even though we are uh, getting to the other side yeah, of this it, pandemic. Exactly, and we'll see longer term. All right, lots to come over the next few hours. So uh, stick around, including some of the most read stories, what's going on over at Goldman and uh, capitalism, how we can do it in a better way. First up, though, let's get a check on World of National News over to Nancy Lyons in D.C. Hey, Nance. Hey, Carol. FBI Director Christopher Wray has been taking questions from senators today over the Capitol riot. He says he was appalled by what happened on January 6th. That attack, that siege, was criminal behavior, plain and simple, and it's behavior that we, the FBI, view as domestic terrorism. It's got no place in our democracy, and tolerating it would make a mockery of our nation's rule of law. Ray says they've already arrested 270 people in connection with the violence, with more being taken into custody by state officials. He says the FBI will not tolerate agitators and extremists who plan to commit violence, period. Well, the demand for the coronavirus vaccine continues to outstrip supply, so President Biden is ready to make an announcement from the White House today. Bloomberg's Amy Morris reports. President Biden will announce that Merck will help make Johnson & Johnson's single-shot vaccine. Johnson & Johnson had allocated a stockpile of a little less than 4 million doses and will provide 16 million more by the end of the month. But this partnership between pharmaceutical rivals will help expand that production capacity. The president will make the official announcement at 415 Wall Street time, and you can hear it here on Bloomberg Radio. In Washington, I'm Amy Morris, Bloomberg Radio. Vernon Jordan has died. He was a civil rights pioneer and Washington power broker who is a behind-the-scenes force in former President Clinton's administration. He was 85. He rose to power in Washington in the 1970s as president of the National Urban League. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists. 
journalist and analyst in more than 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. All right, Nancy, really appreciate that. Uh, Carol Master, along with Tim Stenovic in our Interactive Brokers studio here in New York City. And uh, this is a story you actually did earlier on Quick Take. It is. I love this story. <laughs> I, I love this story for a lot of reasons, and we'll get to them. This is by our own Mr. Lane Gafapulu and Donald Moore. New York's rent slide lures bargain hunters to their dream city. One of the reasons I just love this story is because it profiles several people who've wanted to move to New York, and they saw this as the opportunity because... Look, a lot of people left New York, and, and landlords are willing to offer concessions and lower their prices. Right. It's on sale. It is, and it's such a cool... <laughs> it, you know, New York has been so out of reach for so many people right. for such a long time. And that's what was happening before the pandemic, and I think a lot of people are seeing this as an opportunity where, okay, well, you know, a 24-year-old moving from Los Angeles can now afford to live here. Well, and exactly. And it's perspective whenever you talk about New York City rents or what you pay to live here in terms of what a, an apartment costs. But you talk. there's one individual, you talk about the individual's profile, Claire Smith, moved to Manhattan, as you said, from L.A. in November. She's a 24-year-old blogger. She's a freelance social media manager. She just quit her job in L.A., her two-year lease on her apartment near Hollywood was coming up for new renewal, so she got, she decided to come to New York. She got one month free on a newly renovated two-bedroom at West 10th Street and Bleecker. Great location. Available for thirty-five. Her share of the rent on the fourth floor walk-up is about sixteen hundred, almost seventeen hundred dollars. Well, let's talk about some other numbers here. And that's too, doable. Yeah, in terms that's of totally New York. doable. Fifteen percent decline in Manhattan and eight point six in in Brooklyn and Queens uh, compared with the same time a year ago. The other reason I love this story is because Missy, who was one of the co-authors on this story, also moved during the <laughs> pandemic. And she talked about it on Quick Take earlier today. What did she say? Like She said that you know she moved for professional reasons. She was in Washington, D.C. She moved up here uh, to New York City. Her, her beat changed. And she got a great deal in the East Village. And she was doing her, her – we were doing the interview from her apartment. And it looks fantastic. Like she said, it was, it was the perfect time. It's, listen, a great time. And listen, there's still twice as many rentals available in Manhattan and Brooklyn as a year ago and nearly that many in Queens. So have at it, everybody.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business App, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm John Tucker in the Bloomberg Newsroom with this Bloomberg Business Flash. Concerns around inflated valuations uh, weighing on investor confidence today. The day after the blue chip index's best performance since June, the S&P 500 right now down about to 13 points. The tech-focused Nasdaq Composite Index dropping just over 1%. Now, the fall in U.S. stocks following a tough session in Asia. Now, that came after China's banking regulator also voiced concerns over high valuations of foreign markets. To the moon, rocket companies extending gains for a third day, hitting a fresh record. The sentiment that the home loan provider could be the newest Reddit target for its short interest. But right now, the Dow Jones Investor Leverage again down 42 points. That's a decline of a tenth of a percent. We're at 31,491. The S&P 500, 12 points lower. That's down three-tenths of a percent at 38.89. And the Nasdaq Composite Index, 144 points lower. Again, down just about 1% at 13,444. And the 10-year yield, 141 right now. We have NYMEX crude down 21 cents a barrel. It's 60.43 a barrel. We check the markets for you. Every 15 minutes during the trading day, right here on Bloomberg Radio, I'm John Tucker. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Carol and Tim. That is indeed. All right, John Tucker, thank you so much. So the U.S., count them, one, two, three. We've got three vaccines, Tim, to fight COVID-19. Three vaccines in under a year. <sighs> Just about a year, I think it's fair to say. It's it, phenomenal. It is it is phenomenal. Nobody doubts that in terms of the development. The problem is, though, I think there is some nervousness about this J&J va vaccine. We talked about it with the CEO of Northwell Health yesterday because there are concerns, the lower efficacy rate, people are going to be like, I don't want that one. Yeah. I mean, look, people focusing on 72% instead of 95%. But all the health experts tell us that's not the right thing to focus on. Exactly. So let's get into this story. A great one by Bloomberg News healthcare reporter Angelica Levito on the phone in our New York City bureau. Um, Angelica, good to have you here with us. Listen, it's great to have another vaccine, but it's only great if people take it. Exactly. And you brought up some excellent points that we might see some hesitation. There are great benefits with this J&J &J vaccine. It's refrigerated, so that means that we can get it into rural areas, places that don't have access to these ultra-cold freezers that you need for Pfizer's vaccine. It's also one shot, which is great. You know, you don't have to come back in for a second dose. You're just in and out, and you're done with your vaccination. However, we might see some people worried about this 72% efficacy in the U.S. trials versus that 95% for Pfizer and 94% for Moderna. However, all the health experts, like you said, um, they say that you can't compare these trials apples to apples because they were conducted at different times. Of course, J&J's shot had to contend globally with the variants we're seeing in South Africa, um, Brazil, and also J&J's So that gives J&J's vaccine mm -hmm. a little bit of an up, right? Because it was playing with some of the variants, correct? It does. And that's something that we have evidence of, that it can work against these variants. And also, it's worth noting that the J&J &J vaccine did provide complete protection against all COVID-related hospitalization and death, which is what we're trying to solve for. So let's think back to just a couple of months ago when we were having the same conversation, not necessarily about efficacy, but about hesitation when it came to Moderna and Pfizer. What we saw then was Vice President Pence at the time getting his shot on TV, Anthony Fauci, nation's top infectious disease doctor, getting the shot on TV. The problem is all these people have had their shots already, so right. it's not like they can go and get the J&J &J shot. I, what, I feel like, Angelica, what we need here is like this big PR campaign coming from leaders saying, hey, this is the shot that I want. But they, they've already been vaccinated. That's the problem. That's a great point. It's a really, really good point. And we are hearing from Anthony Fauci, for example, who's telling people, get out there and the first shot that becomes available to you, take it, especially if that's J&J. &J. And the Biden administration has been unified in that message. But you're right, they're vaccinated. So we are going to need to see some new faces out there. Hey, I'll get the shot on the radio. How's that? I volunteer. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and we'll be able to see it on YouTube. Yeah, so exactly. it's a good thing. I mean, whether or not you like it, it's coming, the J&J &J vaccine, because we are expected to hear from President President Biden later on about kind of an unusual collaboration between two competing big pharma companies. We're talking about J&J &J Merck working together to produce it. 
Right. So Merck is going to help J&J manufacture its COVID-19 vaccine. Um, they will equip two facilities to start producing these shots. And later today, we will hear from President Biden about this collaboration. Of course, these two fierce rivals now coming together and sort of describing it as a wartime effort to get shots produced as quickly as possible. When you say as quickly as possible, when they say as quickly as possible, what are we what are we <laughs> thinking here as far as timeline goes? Because Drew Armstrong was on Quick Take earlier today and he said, look, this is the type of thing that takes a long time to get going. Yes, that is a very good point to make because um, as soon as possible could be a few months. And obviously that's not what we think of when we think of as soon as possible. So it could be a while. However, the companies um, are indicating that this could help J&J quickly deliver on its promise to um, to distribute 100 million doses in the U.S. by the end of June. So perhaps this helps us get to that goal right. faster, but TBD. Angelica, what I don't understand is um, why was it J&J ramping up production to begin with? <laughs> like, we knew it was coming. They had high expectation it was going to get through in, in terms of FDA, you know, emergency authorization. What the heck was going on? It's a really great question, and I think it's something that a lot of people are wondering because J and J is a massive company with tremendous resources. However, I've seen you know, their manufacturing. I've <laughs> spent some time with them. It's pretty impressive. But vaccines, as Alex Gorsky, the CEO of Johnson and Johnson, told our Bloomberg colleague, colleague Riley Griffin yesterday. Vaccine production is hard. It takes a lot of energy and it takes everything going exactly right. However, they are saying that they are still on pace to deliver the 20 million shots they've promised by the end of March, which would be a pretty significant ramp up in just a few short weeks. So how quickly do we start to see, I mean, I know the shipments have arrived today. How quickly do we start to see these showing up and where do they show up? And we only have about 30 seconds left. It's um, a great question, and it depends. We've heard from states saying this will go to health departments, mass vaccination clinics. The pharmacies will get them. I talked to CVS this morning, and they'll start actually putting these shots into arms Friday. So I think it depends on um, you know different paces across the country. But we right. will see these shots going to arms this week. All right. Going to leave it there. Angelica, thank you so much. Angelica Levito, a healthcare reporter, joining us uh, from our bureau right here in New York City. Don't you wonder, though? Like yeah. Because we knew, I mean, months ago, they right. knew. So only having 4 million ready to go seems like a small number. We're, we're spoiled because we see these numbers in the millions all the time. And I do wonder, like, are you going to go up to a vaccination site and be like, uh, what am I getting? But remember, I will say one shot, it's one shot. So one dose is, is one inoculation. That's a big deal. And it's a big step forward in terms of, I think, herd immunity helping us get closer to that. All right, good stuff. Stick around, everyone. Bloomberg Business Week. We're continuing. Carol Master, Tim Stenovic, and this is Bloomberg Radio.
Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130 to Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991 to Boston. Bloomberg 1061 to San Francisco. Bloomberg 960 to the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Yes, indeed. The Tuesday edition of Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Master along with Tim Stenovic. You were talking on our planning call about a couple companies. Yeah, Uber and, of course, Postmates as well. I mean, thinking about Uber and the way that his business has shifted over the last year, people yeah. not going places but ordering food, the company's made some big acquisitions and also um, divestitures in the wake of it. We're going to get into that and the details, what you need to know as an investor. Let's, though, check on your top business stories. Another day on the check on that trading day, too. Here is John Tucker. Hey, John. Yeah, and uh, Carol and Tim, S&P 500 lower, and are recording its strong gain since June. Uh, and on Monday, technology among the most worst performers today. You have six of the 12 industry groups in the S&P 500. They're actually higher, being led by materials and consumer staples, the information technology. That's the worst performing group uh, right now. You have the S&P 500 down 12 points. That's down three-tenths of a percent. At 38.89, the NASDAQ Composite Index 148 points lower. That's down 1% at 13,441. And the Dow Jones Industrial Average, 30 points lower. That's down a tenth of a percent. We're at 31,504. And Target uh, reporting today fiscal fourth quarter results that beat expectations. At the same time, the company said it raised its starting wage for all U.S. hourly employees to $15 an hour. You know, look at that. The shares slumping right now. And quick look at Bitcoin. It is down about 2.5% today, 47655 Blame Gary Gensler, the nominee for the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, Gensler said that ensuring the cryptocurrency markets are free of fraud and manipulation is a challenge for the Securities and Exchange Commission. Ten-year yield right now, that is at 141 down ever so slightly. We check the markets for you every 15 minutes during the trading day right here on Bloomberg Radio. I'm John Tucker. That's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Carol and Tim. All right, John Tucker. Thank you so much. So a few new economy companies catching our attention today, both involving two what I would call, Tim, kind of pandemic plays. And we're talking about Uber spinning off its robotic delivery unit uh, and then taking a stake in the new startup. And then we've got Instacart's latest funding round doubling its valuation to a whopping $39 billion. That is a lot of money. <laughs> it is. Fortunately, we have Lizette Chapman, venture capital reporter for Bloomberg News, joining us on the phone from San Francisco. Hey, Lizette, I want to start with this, this uh, Uber news from earlier this morning. Uh, the company spinning off its robotic delivery unit and instead taking a stake in that investment. It's, it's kind of like par for the course for Uber over the last eight or ten months, right? That's absolutely right. Um, this has been part of this focus strategy, CEO, Dar Khosrowshahi has been putting together saying, hey, guys, come hell or high water, no matter what happens with the pandemic, we're going to turn a profit this year in 2021. And in order to do that, um, they, he's been selling off all of these very expensive kind of like experimental, um, you know, R&D projects that are not yet commercially viable. So we've seen these huge divestitures of um, the self-driving car unit to Aurora, flying taxis to Joby, um, you know, the electric scooters and bikes to Line, you know, the India food delivery to Zomato. And and now uh, with this, um, we've got um, them spinning out this uh, food delivery, food and other package delivery companies through robotics to be a standalone. And they're taking stakes in it because it's got a long-term agenda. Yeah, it's like letting go without actually letting go, right? He's he's yeah, he's keeping totally. you know tens of millions and in some case hundreds of millions of dollars invested. What what's the ultimate end game for these? I mean, they they remain independent companies, or do they become part of Uber later? No, um, that's exactly it. It kind of tickled me actually. I was doing the math when I was putting this together um, the other day or last night, and you know we we were totaling them up, and Uber now holds more than thirteen billion dollars in equity stakes in. Uh, standalone companies, and this includes Didi is its largest holding, and it's been slowly whittling that down, but it, it still owns $6.8 billion of Didi's shares, followed by Grab and then Yandex, Taxi, and Russia, 
And then, um, you know, of course, Aurora, the um, self-driving car. And there's some other ones as well. And some of them we don't know right. the total amount that it's worth, like Joby, the flying taxi one. But it is part of this long-term strategy. They're kind of acting like VC. Well, that's what I was going to say. I, Tim and I were talking in the break, and I said it's like a mini soft bank, right? And it's like <laughs> you just keep your hands in things, but it, it frees up some capital. Exactly. I mean, it makes it so that Uber doesn't have to keep investing in and developing these different projects that are not core to its two focuses now, which is delivering people and delivering things. And as you saw in 2020, delivery of things, meaning, you know, groceries and, and, and food and packages and pharm pharmacy items, um, that surged um, 110 percent from 2019. So they're hoping that they can keep that going. They say that they can, and they've extended, interestingly enough, they've extended this arrangement um, that Postmates had um, mm -hmm. with Serve Robotics to go ahead and continue delivering things for them. And, and the idea is that it'll eventually make delivery profitable, and it's not right now. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you. Does it put the company as a kind of goes for a more of a pure purer play in terms of its strategy? Does it put it on the path to profitability? Do people see that? I mean, I guess it depends on who you talk to. That was to. a big like, sigh, ideally, Lizette. Yeah, I mean, you know how it is, right? You know, like they, 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 they were able to cut, you know, Dara was able to cut all of these expenses. So right. that looks good. And, you know, investors, analysts love that. Um, they still have um, their fingers in the pie, though. You know, they still have board seats on a number of these companies that I just listed. And it's in our story uh, here today. Um, and, and in terms of, you know, getting closer to being more profitable, I mean, that's the idea. You remove the cost of humans, right, with these, um, uh, you know, delivery robots um, or, you know, for that case, you know, autonomous cars and you remove the drivers. And that's a, that's a major expense that no longer will be factored into um, Uber services long term if they wind up. Um, you know, continuing on the path they are and, and keeping these these startups really tight to them, but they're not responsible for, for, for paying for their expenses. They're just an equity shareholder. Hey, Lizetta, I, I want to hit on the other story that you wrote, or one of the other stories that you wrote today, Instacart's valuation doubling to $39 billion with new funding. Um, yeah. Investors are obviously bullish on grocery delivery remaining, though, uh, mm -hmm. continuing after the pandemic, and we only have about 30 seconds. Absolutely. I mean, you've seen Instacart. It's now the second most valuable startup in the hmm. U.S. just after um, Elon Musk's SpaceX. To your point, because we only have 30 seconds, um, what they are betting on is that this um, you know, need to order in will become a habit, not just an ex eccentricity. And Instacart is moving now to develop the two other legs of its stool. Everybody knows about the consumer product that you tap on your phone and you want stuff delivered. The two other pieces... Yeah. Are running the back end and then also advertising. So that's what they're going to be using this money to do. Two hundred sixty-five million dollars more. Oh my god! Total. I'm so energized talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it. Um, really appreciate it, Lizette Chapman. Thank you, venture capital reporter at Bloomberg News from San Francisco. Check her out at Lizette underscore Chapman on Twitter. Well, let's get a check of world and national news. And Nancy Lyons in D.C. Hey, Nancy. Hey, Tim. FBI Director Christopher Wray has been grilled by lawmakers on the handling of the Capitol riot. He says once FBI agents in Norfolk saw information circulating about possible violence, they disseminated the information three ways. In an email to the Joint Terrorism Task Force, verbally through a command post briefing, and then through a posting on the LEAP portal to all law enforcement. The information was raw. It was unverified. In a perfect world, we would have taken longer to be able to figure out whether it was reliable but we made the judgment, uh, our folks made the judgment, uh, to get that information to the relevant people as quickly as possible, like I said, three different ways in order to leave as little as possible to chance. The Supreme Court has heard arguments today on the legality of two Republican-backed voting restrictions in Arizona and a case that would further weaken the Voting Rights Act. If the justices endorse the restrictions, it could impact the 2020 midterms. There's also a new salvo in the legislative fight over voting rights in the wake of the 2020 election. Three Republican senators, Bill Haggerty, Marco Rubio, and Kevin Kramer, have introduced a bill called the Protect Electoral College Act. It would restrict state election officials' authority to expand voting by mail unless state lawmakers specifically say it's okay. The bill would also ban federal election security grants to states pending a state-by-state -state review of the 2020 election. Democrats are all but certain to oppose the legislation. House Democrats have begun advancing their own package of election reforms known as H.R. 1. 
the Biden administration supports that package. In Washington, I'm Nathan Hager, Bloomberg Radio. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. Thank you, Nancy. One of the most read stories in the last hour on the terminal has to do with New York Governor Andrew Cuomo. And earlier today, I spoke with New York Assemblyman Ron Kim on Quick Take. The Democratic leader explained why he wants Governor Cuomo to step down. Well, I think I don't think he deserves the privilege of governing in New York State um, after he chose to abuse his power uh, to not only cover up life and death information of nursing homes, but now woman after woman are coming out accusing him of his abusive behavior. Uh, we need to move this state forward. And in order to do that, I think he should step down while we investigate his wrongdoings so we can focus on get, getting the state uh, to recover from the coronavirus. Well, to that end, what is the status of the legislators, uh, the legislation's efforts right now to, to revoke Cuomo's emergency powers? We don't have consensus yet, but there are a few of us uh, who are pushing for impeachment and there are more people every day asking him to step down and resign. Uh, but right now we have 107 Democrats and we're building consensus uh, to figure out what should be the next step. In the next couple of days, we should have something um, to hold him accountable. And that was New York Assemblyman Ron Kim on Quick Take earlier today, uh, explaining why he wants Governor Andrew Cuomo to step down. Uh, Carol, the calls are growing from inside the Democratic Party yes. for Governor Cuomo to do something. Yes, fellow Democrats uh, stepping up, and especially as there seems to be, um, you know, more accounts of uh, harassment or at least charges. I should point out, and I know you know this well, Kim, like there's a back and forth between Cuomo. There's history, right? And Kim has definitely been um, a, a critic and previ previously has spoken out against Cuomo. But you're right. When you look at even the governor's own Democratic Party, they're increasingly, you know, calls for him to step down. There are. And, and look, as Kim noted, there's not even consensus in the party to strip him of his emergency powers right now. So, you know, it's going to be hard for them to get widespread agreement for him to step down. Uh, but the calls are growing, especially after this this third case that the New York Times broke overnight. Yeah, exactly. Listen, this is something in what's been, you know, a crazy political year. Uh, another story along those lines.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm John Zucker, the Bloomberg Newsroom, with this Bloomberg Business Flash. This on the day when technology shares leading the losses in the broader index. Commodity producers and banks, they're rising. You have Apple, Microsoft, and Tesla dragging down the NASDAQ 100. Uh, Target, those shares slumping on an underwhelming profitability outlook. And Rocket, this is a Detroit-based holding company, soaring after we got the news that uh, the stock could be a Reddit target for its high short interest. Call it verbal intervention. The Federal Reserve Governor, Leo Brainerd, said it's going to take some time to meet the conditions laid out by the U.S. Central Bank for reducing the pace of its massive asset purchases, its uh, huge, unprecedented stimulus. Right now, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, well, just turned positive again, back and forth. It's up three points right now, 31,542. The S&P 500, eight points lower. That's down two-tenths of a percent. We're at 38.93. The Nasdaq Composite Index down 1%, down 136 points at 13,452. And the 10-year yield right now, 141. We check the markets for you every 15 minutes during the trading day right here on Bloomberg Radio. That's your Bloomberg Business Flash. I'm John Tucker. Carol and Tim. Thank you, John Tucker. March is Women's History Month, and Bloomberg Radio is looking back at some of the women who played a vital role in American history. Here with more is Bloomberg's Renita Young. On this day in women's history in 1903, the Martha Washington Hotel opens in New York City on East 29th Street, making it the first hotel in the area exclusively for women. All the employees were women with chaperones and a hostess on site at all times. Men, even doctors and priests, were only allowed on the first floor restaurant. The opening of the Martha Washington Hotel was the peak of more than 50 years of poor treatment of women travelers in the United States. Prior to the Civil War and during the 19th century, people looked at female guests who traveled alone with suspicion. So the Martha Washington Hotel marketed itself as a venue catering especially to women traveling or visiting New York alone. That's Today in Women's History. I'm Renita Young, Bloomberg Radio. All right, Renita, thank you so much. So, Tim, we've got an update on the current Bloomberg Business Week cover story. Uh, it's about the sneakerheads that have turned Jordans and Yeezys into an asset class. It profiled Joe Hebert, whose West Coast streetwear was buying and reselling sneakers. His story, you might recall last week, had a little bit of a twist in it. It did. We didn't give away the ending, no. <laughs> but it's kind of like a spoiler alert now. Yeah, and that twist uh, leading to an abrupt action. Let's get the update. With us is Bloomberg Business Week editor Joel Weber on the Axis Line in Brooklyn, along with Bloomberg Business Week freelance writer Josh Hunt, who wrote the story. He's with us from Portland, Oregon. Joel, talk about an impact. Well, I just feel like saying, like, when last we left our hero, um, because <laughs> nice. so much seems to have transpired then. And um, uh, really, that the story uh, took a took another turn yesterday when um, Nike announced the resignation of Ann Hebert, who was Joe's mother. Um, so, so talk to us about the implications of of what all has gone down and what it what it means, Josh. Yeah, I mean, coming into this story. You know, uh, one of the one of the big questions was was what does this all mean? You know, from from the moment that I first learned uh, that Joe's mother, that you know my my main uh, sneaker reselling character was ha had a mother who was a top executive at Nike. Um, you know, what did that mean? It, it's a very gray area, and and you know, readers of the story uh, will note that we didn't accuse them of any wrongdoing because it's a it's kind of an un, it's it was very unclear um, what this meant, and uh, now we have uh, a little bit more clarity uh, what this means now that Nike has taken well Nike hasn't taken any action now that Ann Hebert has um, decided to resign. Um, but uh, uh, frankly, uh, I have to say I'm a little bit surprised because Nike uh, defended Hebert uh, very strongly uh, in the piece. You know. When we them for comments uh, prior to publication. And uh, so, you know, for this to happen so soon after the story landed, I have to think that uh, maybe there was something uh, in the story more than they expected. Um, uh, and, and I still wonder what that might be. To be 
perhaps determined, Josh. I mean, you got your work cut out for you. In the meantime, can you talk a little bit about the conversation that, that that's happening on Twitter right now? Like, what are you hearing from people? Because I've seen that you've uh, been interacting a little bit. Yeah, it's a very interesting time uh, in the sneaker world. I'm hearing, uh, you know, not just from people on Twitter, but uh, another, uh, you know, there's this uh, black-owned um, sneaker resale uh, platform called Another Lane, uh, run by uh, Adina Jones and her husband Chad Jones, and um, and I, uh, you know, in my interview with Adina, uh, when she learned about this twist in the story, she her quote was, "That's the height of privilege," and um, and you know, um, they've been here. They've been getting a lot of uh, uh, positive feedback, uh, you know, from people who've read the story and a lot of support and things like that, and and so. On, on one side of the, the, you know, inside the sneaker community, those sorts of conversations are going on. And on Twitter, it, it's, uh, it's really running the gamut from people who, you know, people who, have, as they, as they uh, you know, so many people are tweeting, uh, quote tweeting uh, my tweet uh, with pictures of Joe's warehouse and saying, ah, so this is why I can't get Jordans. Ah, so this is why I'm, this is why I'm always taking <laughs> This is why I'm always taking an L on the sneakers app, you know. And so, you know, part of it is is um, obviously people are uh, happy to have some clarity about how this world works. Uh, some people are just, uh, uh, you know, kind of um, luxuriating in blind rage over all the sneakers they haven't been able to buy. Um, well, that, I mean, that, it's totally there's right. Even yeah, a I, bit, there's even a little bit of conspiracy theorizing happening. You know, some people are taking it farther than we've actually said in the story. Yeah, that, well, as the internet is wont to do. Um, you know, I think it, it shows the nature of just, like, how fraught this world actually is. And I think we, we, we hinted at some of that without really realizing how much we were going to stir the pot or kick the hornet's nest or whatever, uh, Josh. But because ultimately, like, there are there's some class undertones that I think people are talking about. There's clearly the racial ones, which you indicated. And, and like that, I think like we, we only scratched the surface of what all that meant. And I think that's been sort of part of the fallout. And I think what it really shows now is, you know, we effectively our story was about the economics of this. And, you know, obviously it plays into the tech side of it, how bots can be unleashed to sort of like squirrel away, help, help squirrel away inventory. And all of that kind of, I think, gets back to this challenge that it actually does face corporate America, or at least parts of corporate America, where you have products like this that can really galvanize attention. And also employees who are put in sort of perhaps sometimes uncomfortable positions or, or positions that could be, you know, fraught, I guess. Um, so, Josh, when you think about that, I mean, obviously you've been head down in the sneaker world here, but like when you think about the extrapolations of that through corporate America, can, can you kind of theorize like who else is probably dealing with some of these same fraught conversations? And Josh, we just got about 40 seconds. Sure. Uh, what I can say, I mean, without uh, uh, theorizing too much, what's what's clear to me, um, the part of why this touched such a nerve is that this sneaker world is kind of at the at the nexus of, you know, it's a, a little bit like the GameStop stuff and the Bitcoin stuff in the sense that it's both a subculture and a market. And so you've got all these uh, people from different class backgrounds, from dis different racial backgrounds, these, these uh, uh, this, you know, big mix of people coming right. together, trying to be involved in a market and, um, and you know, all kinds of kind of Right. Flashes happening. Well, it's incredible. The story goes on. As we said, another another edition of the story. <laughs> hey, Josh, thank you so much. Freelance writer at Bloomberg Business Week from Portland, and Joel Weber, editor of Bloomberg Business Week. Do you want to mention a headline crossing? Uh, governor, former governor of the state of Rhode Island, Gina Raimondo, winning Senate confirmation to be U.S. Commerce Secretary again. The governor of Rhode Island winning her Senate confirmation to be Commerce Secretary.
news, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm John Zucker in the Bloomberg News. We're with this Bloomberg Business Flash. Gains in commodity producers and banks offsetting a slide in technology companies today. Earlier today, China's top banking regulator said he's very worried about risks from bubbles in global financial markets. That didn't help the bullish sentiment. And bullishness among Wall Street strategists approaching levels that have already presaged potential trouble for stocks. That is according to Bank of America. Well, over at Academy Securities, Peter Shear is head of macro strategy. He says he remains bullish on stocks, but he is getting a lot more selective. I am, but it's more reduced down to what's going to benefit from infrastructure spending, what's going to benefit from resumption of travel. And at the other end of the spectrum, there is froth in parts of the market. So I am pulling back from those really kind of actually nervous that we could see a significant pullback in some of the frothy end. So it's a little bit more of a mixed bag when looking at my portfolio. And I've also been really pulling out of Europe and the rest of the world. I think they're just not getting it. Well, what's going on at Goldman Sachs? Karen Seymour, who sent Martha Stewart to prison as a prosecutor and then went on to help Goldman Sachs executives stay out of trouble, is now leaving the bank. Seymour is leaving as Goldman Sachs general counsel was marks a second departure from Goldman's top decision-making group in as many days. As we look at the markets right now, the major indices, they're mixed. Dow Jones Industrial Average is 37 points higher. That's up a tenth of a percent right now. We're at 31,572. The S&P 500 down about five points. That's down a tenth of a percent. We're at 3896 right now with the S&P 500. The Nasdaq Composite Index, tech-heavy Nasdaq, down about nine-tenths of a percent. We're down 114 points at 13,473. And as we look at the Treasuries right now, the 10-year yield is at 140. We check the markets for you every 15 minutes during the trading day right here on Bloomberg Radio. I'm John Tucker. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Bloomberg Quick Takes Tim Stenovic on Bloomberg Radio. And Bloomberg Business Week brought to you by SEI. Since its founding 50 years ago, SEI has provided investment managers and asset owners with robust infrastructure platforms and flexible outsourcing solutions. Go to SEIC.com slash IMS. So what is going on in the hallowed halls of old time Wall Street, Tim Stenebeck? That's the big question. <laughs> it is, and it's our top story at this hour. Several stories, actually, in the last few days. People coming and going, uh, mostly going, especially from Goldman Sachs. Yeah, that's right. Um, Wall Street poaching is heating up with fintech funds on the hunt. Yeah, exactly. So let's get more from Anders Mellon. He is executive compensation reporter at Bloomberg News, wealth reporter at Bloomberg News, and Sri Natarajan, finance reporter at Bloomberg News. Both are uh, on the phone in New York City. Anders in our New York bureau. And Sri, I got to start with you because that news today, another very senior Goldman executive leaving. Uh, we just heard John Tucker talk about it. Karen Seymour, Goldman Senior uh, or general counsel, what's going on with Goldman? It's a great question, Carol. Uh, look at the backdrop. Goldman had a phenomenal 2020. Uh, they've had a good start to the year. Their stock is ripping ever higher, near all-time highs. And yet you're seeing some high-profile departures. It's not unusual to see people leave a firm, a big Wall Street firm at this time of the year. Cue the bonus noise. <laughs> but... What is unusual here is the profile of the kind of people leaving at a time when you would expect calm sees a place like Goldman. So, Sri, when, when so many high-profile people leave in such a short period of time, is there any concern about the type of message that that sends to the firm? Oh, absolutely. And, 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 and the way it's done, in the case of Karen Seymour, she's leaving after three years, which might seem like she's been there for a while, but you typically just do not see great turnover in a seat like that. A general counsel role at a firm like Bowman Sachs is one of the most plum assignments, but also one of the most challenging assignments in, 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 in the corporate world uh, when it comes to legal jobs. Her predecessor was in that seat for 26 years, and that might have been unusually long. Uh, Karen Seymour is out in three years because this role is tied to who the chief executive officer 
prefers and the sense that we are getting is he wanted to install his own person, which is why Karen Seymour is leaving Goldman Sachs. But look at some of the other departures. Mm -hmm. Uh, The head of Goldman's consumer bank, that is the big new fledgling business at Goldman Sachs on which they have pinned their future. They have said it will become a very part of what Goldman Sachs will be in the future. So it's not a good look when the head of that business leaves and a top uh, deputy of his, who are two of the four partners in the business. The only one left is an executive who joined three weeks ago and another one who has already moved into this chairman sort of role because he was the original face of Marcus. And then you have the asset management head. That is another big focus area for Goldman Sachs under David Solomon. And just six months ago, he promoted Eric Lane to co-head this expanded asset management business. Surely he would not have expected that he would get up and leave. And he has done just that. And not to retire or go off into the sunset, but go and work at a large investment right. firm. This, this big investing whale out there, which is Chase Coleman Tiger Global. Right. It's not like they're buying a big sailboat and sailing the world. Um, So Anders Mellon, come on in, because you've got a great story on the Bloomberg about Wall Street poaching going on by fintech in the fun world. Talk, like, kind of broaden this out here. What are we seeing? Because it does feel like a lot of people are leaving those plum jobs on Wall Street to go to startups or to start up a business for a Walmart. Yeah. So like like Shri is saying, you know, partly this might be chalked up to a bit of shuffling that happens after bonus season. But what people that I spoke to yesterday also told me is that it's it's sort of indicative of the just a mess of, of ripe opportunities that are to be had by top people, especially if you are specialized in areas like fintech or crypto or something that has a heavy financial component to it in, in terms of tech. And there's a lot of money sloshing around to lure them away. So um, obviously a prominent example that Shri mentioned is Omar Ismail, who left um, Goldman's consumer bank, uh, Marcus, uh, to lead a new Walmart venture that we don't know a ton about yet. Um, but clearly a, a, an interesting opportunity, I'm sure, for him to build something that has uh, the backing and the resources by a brand of Walmart and then potentially the ability to touch tens of millions of customers through the stores that that, um, that Walmart has. And Goldman Sachs, as we know, don't really have that kind of footprint. So what does a company like Goldman Sachs have to do in order to retain top talent? So, yeah, that's also something I ask people. And it's, you know, it, it's, it's a little tough. Um, one thing that was pointed out to me was that, you know, this decisions like this isn't necessarily about money. It's about building new things. You get to be part of, of, of making a big impact. But in these situations, you know, money tends to not be an issue until it is an issue. Right. Um, there's a lot of money sloshing around. And, and, and in new ventures like this, Perhaps at, at Walmart, you tend to be able to sometimes see creations of special classes of stock in privately held ventures or profit sharing plans that can be extremely lucrative. It can be a bit controversial to set something like that up at a, at a big public company where you have a, a publicly traded stock and, and that can create some discord internally. Right. So money could be, be a factor, that's for sure. But it is an opportunity to lead something and kind of that's all your own. Hey, Shri, last question. Um, does David Solomon need to be worried at all? Are people questioning like, hey, David, what's going on at Goldman? Just quickly. One would have to assume that shouldn't be the case, right? Okay. You, you just come off of 2020 when, uh, uh, let's be honest, the pandemic slump for, slump for most people proved to be extremely profitable for Goldman Sachs. But at the same time, you had a slew of departure. And Carol, you and I have talked about this uh, mm-hmm. so many times in the past, in the first couple of years of David Solomon's uh, reign as the CEO, and that was chalked up to regime change. When you have a new management, people of the old guard are automatically flushed out, and that is to be expected. Right. But then what explains what's been happening over the last three months? Even before uh, this little chunk of uh, exits that we've heard about just in this past uh, three or four days, we had Greg Lemka, the well-liked investment right. banker, uh, investment bank boss at Goldman leaving and he went to work at another firm. That was totally unexpected and that has started with people. So these moves are certainly reverberating inside the firm. Yeah. As long as the money is good and the stock is doing well, it isn't a problem. But when the mm. good times end on that front, yeah. all attention will focus to uh, what's happening with your workforce. 
Goldman shares up 26% so far this year. All right, Trina Narajan, finance reporter at Bloomberg News. Thank you. And our thanks to Anders Mellon, wealth reporter at Bloomberg News. All right, let's get to World of National News. Nancy Lyons in D.C. Hey, Nance. Hey, Tim. FBI Director Christopher Wray says violent domestic extremists motivated by racial and anti-government ideology are being given equal priority to Islamic State and other terrorist groups. He's been testifying on Capitol Hill today, making his first comment since the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. He was asked how the agency disseminated the intelligence they received in the days prior to the attack. That information was quickly, as in within an hour, disseminated and communicated with our partners, including the U.S. Capitol Police, including Metro PD, in not one, not two, but three different ways. Ray says the threat was raw, unverified, and uncorroborated. Last week, law officials at the Capitol said that the FBI did not adequately prepare them for what unfolded. Gina Raimondo has easily won Senate confirmation today as U.S. Commerce Secretary. The former Rhode Island governor will be at the heart of President Biden's efforts to revive the U.S. economy and confront alleged unfair trade practices by China. Gary Gensler, President Biden's pick for the Securities and Exchange Commission, says making sure retail investors are protected when using trading apps would be a focus if the Senate confirms him to lead the Wall Street's top to be Wall Street's top regulator. Markets and technology are always changing. Our rules have to change along with them. At his confirmation hearing today, he ticked off a few items that would be priorities, including so-called gamification, in which trading firms pay brokers for the right to execute customers' orders. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. All right, this is what I love about Bloomberg, and this is what I love about the most read. I go to it probably a million times in a day. I look at what's the most read in the last eight hours, so like the full day, what's the most read in the past 60 minutes, and that's when things can just pop out of nowhere. Yeah. Well, this story by <laughs> Stephen Church just popped out of nowhere. It talks about Hertz, and go back, what was it, about a year or so? Like yeah, I mean, it was, it was post-pandemic. It was over the summer. I remember, you know, Hertz in bankruptcy and people sending shares of the stock higher, thinking, what is going on here? And we're all like, well, wait a minute. I mean, the stock went as much, uh, it was up as much as 896%, uh, <laughs> prompting Hertz to briefly capitalize on the frenzy by issuing even more stock because they could. Um, but it was that kind of original, what we've seen play out with GameStop and some others. And it's kind of interesting, uh, you know, that that happened. And I think we thought it was kind of a one-time thing. And then here we are, 2021, and we saw what we saw just a few weeks ago. Yeah, GameStop, AMC, and perhaps others moving forward. Uh, the conclusion, though, outlined today in this reorganization plan to end the nine-month trip through Chapter 11 for Hertz Global Holdings is a cautionary tale for the little guy because holders of Hertz shares, remember those traded for as much as $2.53, since just a few months ago, they are going to get zero. And that's what happens. You know, when you think about equity holders, right? Exactly. That is the risk, that it goes to zero. Listen, this is what I love. When you go through kind of the money scale, like who gets paid first? I mean, equity guys, sorry about it. You last. Yeah, and oftentimes <laughs> you get nothing. Or you get nothing, exactly. And it's something to remember, especially when a company uh, goes through some kind of reorganization. The plan, though, values the reorganized company at nearly $5 billion, fully repays Hertz first lien and second lien creditors. That's what happens. Unsecured bondholders would get the option to take a cash payout of 70% of their investment's face value or roll their debt into new financing, according to a Hertz statement. But you need to understand that when a company goes bankrupt or insolvent, like there is a pecking order when it comes to who gets paid what or who gets paid back at all. I would imagine it was a tough lesson for a lot of the shareholders who bought early this summer. Yeah, exactly. Maybe a good lesson for some of those new investors.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm John Tucker in the Bloomberg Newsroom. With this Bloomberg Business Flash, markets seem to be vacillating between optimism and pessimism today. If concerns around inflated valuations beginning to weigh on investor confidence. Right now, let's check in with the Bloomberg Macro Squawk Desk. And here's Bill Maloney. And good afternoon, John. U.S. stocks right now trading lower in choppy trade. Dow is currently down 34 points. s and dropped 13. And NASDAQ is lower by 151. The U.S. 10 yield at 1.4%. Gold is up 11. And transports gained 39 points. Among the main 11 SB sectors, leaders were materials and consumer staples. Tech was under pressure. And leaders to the upside in the Dow, Dow Inc. and Chevron, while Caterpillar and Intel led to the downside. In deal news, Coindesk tweeted that PayPal is buying a crypto storage firm. And in other news, Rocket soared as much as 74%. It could be another Reddit play. After earnings, C3 AI fell 16%. Zoom Video dropped 7.5%. And Target declined by 9%. Wrapping things up, some of the names pointing out that are belts tonight include Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Nordstrom, and Fubu TV. Live from the First Breaking News Desk, I'm Bill Maloney. John? All right, Bill, thanks a lot. And to get live breaking news on your terminal, type SQUA Go. We have among the most actively traded stocks in today's session. Shares of Apple down right now 1.2%. Again, the S&P 500, 14 points lower. We check the markets for you every 15 minutes throughout the trading day right here on Bloomberg Radio. I'm John Tucker. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, John Tucker, thank you so much. So in this week's Bloomberg Business Week, Small Business Survival Guide, a story about a small business owner helping other small businesses. More specifically, we're talking about a Minneapolis distillery. It's owned by Chris Montana. He has been on the front line of the dual pandemic of COVID and racism. Chris is the owner of Du Nord Craft Spirits, and he joins us on the phone from Minneapolis, along with Bloomberg Business Week contributor Nick Lieber, who wrote the story. He joins us on the phone in Brooklyn. And Nick, first of all, I have to tell you, we've been talking about Chris in the newsroom. We feel like this guy has just done so much good. How did Chris come to your attention? You know, I was very curious about how businesses are faring in the, in the recovery or the sort of uneven recovery of small businesses. And I reached out to Chris, and he was kind enough to talk to me about um, everything he's been up to, which is a lot. But I was surprised by what, you know, by his story. I didn't realize how much he was doing. Um, and he, you know, he's, he, he's sort of given dozens and dozens of grants to local, um, local mainstays in the community, local businesses. He set up a food bank, um, and he has this vision for an incubator. Um, that I think is really interesting. Hey, Chris, come on in here. Uh, take us back to just about a year ago when the pandemic hit. What did you have to do? Well, first of all, thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it seems like uh, ages ago, but right when the pandemic uh, hit, we the first step was uh, our staff uh, didn't feel safe. And so our business model at that point was we got most of our revenue from a cocktail room when uh, less so in distribution. It's very hard for small companies to make money in distribution. And so we decided to shut down the cocktail room. And with that, we kissed goodbye to most of our revenue. And, you know, we're a small 100% family owned. It's my wife and I company. And we really, we thought that was the end. Um, and, but the thing that, that we did have is we had some booze laying around. We knew that there wasn't enough hand sanitizer. And so we decided that we'd take what we had, we'd make some sanitizer, and we'd give it away to first responders and other people who needed it. Well, and I, I mentioned on the introduction, Chris, that you were really dealing with a dual pandemic because first the pandemic hits, and then, of course, what happened to George Floyd in Minneapolis, which we all saw, and we've talked often here at Bloomberg about kind of the dual pandemic of health crisis and also racism uh, across our society. You actually took a blow as a result of it because of the protests and the violence that happened in Minneapolis, um, something that happened to your warehouse. Yeah, I mean, we, we had some damage. We had some folks break in and uh, set some fires uh, in, our, in our warehouse. And, you know, it took out, you know, our, a lot of inventory and we had some machines in there. We had 
mistakenly thought that that would be the safer place. So beforehand, we had moved a lot of things into the warehouse, thinking that would make them safer than the other side of the building, which had a lot of windows. Um, and, you know, and that, that's unfortunate. And I, I, mm-hmm. it was very hard. I'm not, I'm not going to try to paper over that at all. I mean, it, I, I definitely shed more than <laughs> more tears than I have in a very long time. It's hard to watch something that yeah. you've worked on uh, burn. Uh, but oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Well, I was going to say, Nick, what is it that you you wanted to find out about Chris? Um, I, I was I was curious how you sort of how you reinvent something in in the midst of also trying to make have your business be able to survive. And this idea of you know, sort of stepping back for a second and saying, what, what, what does my community need as opposed to what does my business need um, was, was something that, that Chris sort of taught me about. And, and, and Chris, you recognized what your community needed. You raised hundreds of thousands of dollars in a GoFundMe, um, but what did you do with it? Well, we we didn't think we were going to raise as much money, um, and it really started because people were raising money for us, and we had some insurance, and we didn't want to get a windfall from this, and so we set out to raise thirty thousand dollars, and then we ended up raising a million bucks. And what we did with it is we created a foundation. That foundation had three goals. One was to run this food bank because we had food insecurity. But the second one, where most of the money went, uh, was to grants to other small businesses because many, particularly black and brown-owned businesses, uh, they were uninsured or underinsured, and it would be a double injustice if George Floyd would be murdered in the aftermath. We would also lose the few businesses that we had that were starting to bring the business community to black and brown communities. And so we gave out grants up to $15,000. Uh, we helped out 74 different businesses, many of whom are back up today. It's so great. And I know you're you're trying to buy and renovate a big building to serve as an incubator for nascent entrepreneurs to use rent-free to launch food and beverage businesses. Man, you are giving back on multiple levels. Um, it's really wonderful and an honor to talk with you, Chris. And we really wish you well. And Nick, thank you so much for bringing the story to us. And I highly recommend folks, we'll put it out on Twitter, but go to Bloomberg.com for more. Nick Leiber, contributor of Bloomberg Business Week with us from Brooklyn. And Chris Montana, owner of Do Nord Craft Spirits, on the phone from Minneapolis. Man. It's incredible. We talk so much about ways that businesses have pivoted and shifted. Yeah. Dude Nord now doing a ton of business when it comes to e-commerce, and the growth there is just phenomenal, too. Yeah, and finding his way back, but also helping others find their way back. Just love it. All right, you're listening to Bloomberg Radio.
Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130 to Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991 to Boston. Bloomberg 1061 to San Francisco. Bloomberg 960 to the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Business Week. All right, coming up. Chart it of the day. is the song of the day and yeah. the chart of the day. Getting ready? I'm getting ready because the Googling fingers are ready. <laughs> We're always ready. All right, warming them up. Uh, also warming up is uh, typing fingers, uh, John Tucker, with a check on your top business stories. Where should we begin, John Tucker? Um, let's begin after yesterday's run-up, Carol. Tech leading the stock losses today. You have Tesla dragging down the NASDAQ 100. The electric car maker tumbling more than 4%. Uh, Jack Manley, J.P. Morgan Investment Management Global Market Strategist, says this year the tide won't be lifting all boats for stocks, and he is uh, right now urging investors to balance growth and value. If you want to be positioned to capture these shorter-term opportunities but still be in the game for the long run, I think you do still need to strike that balance between growth and value. Just recognize that, as with last year, this year is going to be another year of, I think, probably winners and losers. Well, right now, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, 55 points lower. That's down two-tenths of a percent at 31,486. S&P 500 is 15 points lower. That's down four-tenths of a percent. We're at 3886. And as that composite index, down 161 points, 1.2 percent lower right now at 13,427. Let's look at uh, crude oil right now. That's lower. Extending declines. NYMEX crude, West Texas down uh, $1.459.60 a barrel right now. And the yield on the benchmark 10 year note at 1.41%. Here's one for you Icon Health and Fitness exploring an initial public offering. Uh, could value the company at more than $7 billion, according to people familiar with the matter. They make Nordic Track. And I can tell you, Nordic Track is a terrific way to hang up your clothes at night. We check the markets for you every 15 minutes during the trading day. Right I have here. one of those, John Tucker. <laughs> or you used to. I hang my suits off. It. It's great. <laughs> Tim, stand up. Don't you have one of those? Um, no, I don't. But it's the workout <laughs> equipment that is like the perfect place for hanging things. We don't even have room for that, Carol. <laughs> That's right. You're in a New York apartment. <laughs> yeah. John Tucker lives in those. You know, he's got this massive mansion out in New Jersey. I right. lost him. Post-pandemic, we're going to John's. <laughs> we are indeed. All right, you're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. This is Bloomberg. And uh, the reason I picked that song is that the last of the original Whalers, uh, who in later years was known as Bunny Whaler, uh, died today at the, oh. you know, he died, you know. Uh, I mean, yeah, it, it, yeah. It's been a long time since Bob Marley uh, passed away of cancer, 40 years actually. Wow. Uh, and wow. Uh, Peter Tosh, you know, died in the 80s as well. And uh, Bunny Whaler uh, just today, he was 73. That's what mm. I was looking for. Okay, yeah, kind of young. I consider that like yeah. that's a, the young age nowadays. Bob Marley was so young when he died. <sighs> right, I forget that. Yeah. All right. Um, well, we're down, gl we're glad you did the song. Yeah. Simmer down. That's what may well happen to the S and P 500 if history is any guide. It's a point that. Uh, Ryan Dietrich, who's the uh, chief market strategist at LPL Financial, made the other day in a blog post, basically looking back at, you know, the past year for the S&P 500 and then sort of the two fastest starting bull markets before then, uh, you know, going back to, uh, in one case, 2009 and in the other, uh, 1982. And so... The chart, it's just a simple comparison of percentage moves. Um, you saw that in the first year or so, it was pretty much straight up uh, in the earlier uh, bull markets, as it has been this time around, ever since last March. 
But, you know, you get to about a year out in the earlier gains, and you know, stocks kind of stalled out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you may be looking at six months without much direction. We've certainly seen that a lot in the past week and a half or so. But, you know, just historically, you know, if you looked at the earlier bull markets, you know, six months after sort of where we are now in relative terms, uh, you know, the S&P 500 was a little changed to lower. Then, of course, it picked up and moved on from there. So, you know, that's sort of a, a bit of a perspective, you might say. And as Dietrich put it in the blog post, history would say, be open to some type of weakness or consolidation hmm. in stocks. And if you want to know more, folks, send me an email. I'll get you the chart, the explanation that goes with it, and everything I do going forward. The email address is dwilson at bloomberg.net. That's dwilson at bloomberg.net. You know, Dave, one thing that is just so interesting about this chart, and you can see it on our um, YouTube, if you're watching us on YouTube right now, is that there are, you know, two other periods of bull market that it's compared to, right? August right. 1982 to August 1987. And then... March 2009 to February 2020, which, by the way, was only 13 months ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's when that bull market ended. So right. I mean, at least it, it tells you, you know, some of the possibilities going forward. I mean, you're talking about uh, basically an 11-year advance that uh, we went through before the current bull market began. Of course, the previous one uh, in the 80s lasted five years, you know, was sort of ended by the Black Monday crash definitively in, in 87. Uh, but, you know, bull markets do have a way of kind of hanging around for a while. And even if things kind of stall out here, it may be as much as anything an opportunity uh, for investors kind of left behind in the past year or so. Well, and I also do wonder, Dave, you know, if we get more stimulus money that comes into the economy, how that will impact things. And I also do think a rotation in the trade that allows some of those more beaten down names to actually have an opportunity to attract some money, how that potentially keeps the bull market going. I mean, there is a lot of back and forth that can happen here. We've certainly seen a fair amount of it in the past few months alone. So, you know, the idea that we may get more of that. And in the meantime, you know, stocks may, may struggle to find a direction. I mean, if you're looking at it from a historical perspective, uh, it, it would certainly be understandable, if nothing else. Dave, if I'm not mistaken, at the top of our show today, one of the songs that we had was by The Specials, which is another ska band. So it's like Absolutely. A, a, a show full of ska this afternoon. I like it. There you go. Oh, here it is. I like it. That's I went through one. this. I, I have to tell you, being from Southern California, yeah. you know, you go through this like Bob Marley ska, at least in the 90s. That's what we did <laughs> in middle school. It was all Bob Marley, all ska. You know, this is a nice little throwback to my middle school days. I love it. I love it. Let's get a little window into yeah. Tim Stenovic <laughs> in fourth grade. Yeah, just don't open grade. the window too much, okay? I promise. <laughs> We've been warned. We've been warned. All right, Dave Wilson, thank you so much. Check out his uh, chart of the day. You can also, of course, check out that post on the chart of the day at The One Dave on Twitter. Let's get a check of world and national news with Nancy, Nancy Lyons in Washington, D.C. Hey, Nance. Hey, Tim. The director of the FBI, Christopher Wray, took some questions today from the Senate Judiciary Committee about the Capitol riot, and he defended his agency. He says a raw intelligence warning the day before the attack was disseminated via several channels. Bloomberg's Zerf Chapman has more from Washington. Ray told Chairman Dick Durbin that hundreds of arrests of those who attacked the Capitol made their motivations clear. We're seeing quite a number of what we would call militia violent extremists. We also have violent extremists specifically advocating for the superior of the white race. Do you have any evidence that the Capitol attack was organized by, quote, fake Trump protesters? We have not seen evidence of that at this stage, certainly. Ray added that no anarchists or anti-fascists or jihadists have been among those arrested, but the FBI takes all sources of terrorism seriously. In Washington, Earth Chapman, Bloomberg Radio. Fresh on the heels of announcing the Ultra-Millionaire Tax Act, Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren spoke with Bloomberg's Kevin Cirilli about the proposal that she says has widespread support. People across this nation get it. Independents, Republicans, Democrats, a majority of all of them want to see us do a wealth tax because they know that the system is rigged against them. The people who are out of step are the folks here in Washington. Her proposal calls for an annual tax of two cents on every dollar over 50 million, three cents on every dollar for those worth more than one billion. You can hear Kevin's full interview with Senator Warren right here at 5 p.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg Sound On. 
Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. This is Bloomberg. All right, Nance, thank you so much. Greatly appreciated. Uh, we got to get to this story. This is, uh, in the last eight hours, the sixth most read story on the Bloomberg. It's about the four-day work week gaining popularity without costing productivity. Uh, all you heads of companies, are you listening up? Yeah, by the way, um, <laughs> I wonder why everybody wants to read about a 20% so reduction in work but getting the same pay. This is a great story by Stefan Nicola in Berlin. He joined us on Quick Take earlier today to talk all about it. Um, but the gist is, is that there is one company at least, a the Berlin-based tech company, uh, flipped open their laptops and started working from home or working from the kitchen when the world went into lockdown. And then they started thinking about, hey, what if we eased into the weekend by signing off around lunchtime on Friday? The experiment was really successful sales, employee engagement, client satisfaction, they all rose. And then in January, they decided to go a step further, rolling out a four-day work week. Listen, many would argue productivity experts, it's not how long you work, it's just how well you work. And if by, you know, I'm very deadline-oriented, you give me a deadline and I'll get it done. And I do wonder if you <laughs> condense those deadlines, do you get more things done? Work smarter, not work longer. Smarter. I mean, it's, it's, it's really what, you know, Netflix has talked about for years and Reed mm -hmm. Hastings at Netflix, mm -hmm. this infamous culture deck, right? It's, it's not about how hard you work, it's about how smart you work. And look, we can debate the merits of the Netflix culture for, you know, an entire show. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is they built an incredible company with right. that culture deck. Listen, and there are other folks that are saying Jack Ma, uh, co-founder of Alibaba, who frequently hails his country's grueling 996 work culture, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week, as vital for long-term success. However, ZipRecruiter is saying that, or Zip Recruiter, I should say, saying the share of postings that mention a four-day work week has tripled in the past three years to 62 per 10,000. Well, well, I mean, well, still little. just needed to catch on. <laughs> By the way, did you know the weekend is only like uh, a century old? I didn't. I That's the thing I forgot. Like, we just take it for granted. We but do. It, but it, it was Henry Ford. Henry Ford. Little history lesson. 1920s. You're going to have to read the story. Most read. Among.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm John Tucker in the Bloomberg Newsroom with this Bloomberg Business Flash. After the biggest rally in nine months, technology shares leading losses in the broader market right now. Treasuries, uh, they have stabilized. Target, uh, an individual stock, they're slumping on an underwhelming profitability outlook. You have Rocket Companies, this is a holding company in Detroit, soaring after a news report that the stock could be a Reddit target for its high short interest. And Tesla shares dragging down the Nasdaq 100 with the electric car maker tumbling over 4%. And we have Ford Motor Company, the most actively traded stock, up 5.4%. Apple shares, they're down 1.4% in today's trading. Dow Jones Industrial Average down 58 points at 31,477. The S&P 500 right now 17 points lower at 38.84. And the Nasdaq Composite Index one and a quarter percent lower, down 173 points at 13,411. We check the markets for you every 15 minutes during the trading day right here on Bloomberg Radio. I'm John Tucker, and that is your Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, John Tucker, thank you so I'm much. My car, I turn on the radio. How about you let me drive? Oh, no, 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 no. Who's going to drive you home? Honey, please, I'll do the driving. Drive on. Excuse me, I don't want to drive. Just drive, baby. It's the question that drives us. This is the drive to the close. That funky music will drive us till the dawn. On Bloomberg Radio. All right, so it is the drive to the close. Just about 11 minutes left in today's trading session. Bouncing around, uh, Tim, uh, higher, lower, higher, lower, uh, back and forth. Right now, as John Tucker mentioned, down about 21 points on the S&P, a decline of about 76 points on the Dow. That's just a quarter of a percentage point lower. Uh, S&P down about half a percent. NASDAQ, though, those tech names continuing to take the most heat, down about 1.4%, 194 points. But I think it's safe to say we continue to have these conversations about overvaluation, uh, taking a little money off the table when it comes to the na these names. But even when that happens, it seems like investors often have a tendency to come back in when they can get in at a lower price point. Yeah, that's kind of what we have been seeing over the past few weeks. Mm -hmm. Buy the dip. Investors don't want to miss out on what we saw over the last few months, and they see any opportunity, especially with the high-flying tech companies, to come in when there is any sort of decline. And I think it'll be interesting as we go along further, as we continue to see, and fingers crossed that the economy continues to gain more ground, we get to see, we'll get a big number on Friday, the monthly jobs report. It's backwards looking, but it gives us a good gut check on where we are in the U.S. labor market if we continue to see that repairing, fingers crossed, because there are still millions out of work at this point. And whether or not we continue to see certainly the equity trade evolve, we keep talking about the reflation trade as uh, investors are looking into those sectors of the economy that will do better as the economy does better. So let's broaden out and talk a little bit about the market. Yeah, Ron Carson is chief executive officer of the Carson Group. Joining us on the phone from Scottsdale, Arizona, the Carson Group has more than $13 billion in assets under management. Hey, Ron, uh, great to have you on the show. What are you keeping an eye on in today's market? Well, I think it's interesting, you know, the volatility in the market um, uh, is what we've grown used to. But what's really impressive is this economy. I mean, we are clearly we've got profits back above pre-COVID levels or pre-pandemic levels. Um, we have, you know, Q1 is probably going to come in GDP around 10 percent. That's the best. since almost I started in the business in 1983. On top of that, we've but it's a bounce back. It's a bounce back, it's right? Bounce we have to be back. smart about yeah. how we read that number. Okay. And, and it's, a, it's a bounce back, but there's a lot of stimulus that's continuing to come. And we have the 1.9 trillion fiscal. We, you know, on behind that, we've got a two trillion dollar infrastructure spend that I think will juice the economy for some time. And then on top of that, um, this the pent up demand. I mean, the amount of money the consumer has saved. Currently, Americans have. Almost four trillion dollars. Now that's two and a half trillion more than we had, you know, prior to um, uh, the pandemic. And so, what I'm what I'm really watching is inflation. Well, yeah. we saw interest rates really move up. Um, we've had Powell 
signal we're going to be ultra dovish. I mean, he basically said full employment, 2% average, not 2% inflation, 2% average. So that means it's got to happen over a period of time. And then we have to have projections showing 2% or more. So we've got the Fed definitely in here going to support the market. We've got the average consumer has got a ton of cash. They've had nowhere to spend it. They've got a lot of desire to spend it. And so if I wanted to really pick something to worry about, I think we're headed for you know some real inflation in the future. You know, it, it, it's so interesting you talk about how strong the economy is and how strong you project it to be. Because, yes, we, we do see a recovery happening in stocks. That happened. Corporate profits are, are, are strong, as we're learning from earnings. But there are still millions of Americans who are unemployed right now. Um, that has a serious economic effect. It does. We have 10 million people that are unemployed. And I, I, I believe, and when we, especially as the economy is starting to open up, I think we just had Texas come out and said, hey, we're going to lift the mask mandate um, in our own community in Omaha, Nebraska, and I'm out in Arizona right now. I mean, people are starting to live again, and I think we're going to start seeing job creation. And, you know, when you look at the infrastructure spend that the you know, current administration is going to, I believe, going to get through, that's going to that's going to mean a lot of jobs you know, over the next decade. So um, I think I think and, and not to mention, I think another piece that's being missed here is this massive shift to a digital economy. Mm. And there's going to be a handful of people that are going to try to hold on to those, you know, call them old world jobs that just aren't going to translate uh, into the future. So there's also going to need to be an element of retraining in here. Well, that's a good point. I feel like we've been talking about retraining, though, for a long time as the economy and the world continues to innovate and we continue to see disruption. How uncomfortable that might that make, though, the economy as we see that kind of dislocation? Carol, I think it's very uncomfortable, and I've witnessed it, you know, in my own life. Um, grew up in a farm and watched farming. The farmers have to make that transition, which was a very difficult transition. And then, you know, if you look at the, you know, the, the old skills that you had to have as a worker versus what you have, to have today, and when we were handling rollovers for a lot of people that were getting, you know, their jobs eliminated, they really just didn't have the skills for the next job. It's uncomfortable, but it's a reality. I mean, mm. change is a constant. And if you're not prepared for it, um, we, adaptability is going to be key as we move forward as a society into the future. We're going to have to be more adaptable than we've ever been in the past. Well, a couple of companies that you're keeping an eye on that you are bullish on include Microsoft and United Healthcare. Uh, let's talk Microsoft here. Uh, why is there still room for Microsoft to go higher? Yeah, you know, Microsoft with a $1.6 trillion market cap, they, we're, I was just talking about this a few days ago. You know, we use, um, you know, Microsoft Office Teams, you know, they, it's enabled the company to really transition from the heart of operations to a launch pad for, you know, their enterprise cloud workflows, Azure. And you talk about um, a company that has adapted, you know, look at Microsoft. I mean, they've gone, they're, they're, to me, they've, they've appleized, right, the things that they do. They've made them so simple that anybody can, can use them and be productive. And we've seen a tremendous productivity lift even in our own organization through Microsoft. So we think that um, they're going to take advantage of that. And the shift to the cloud computing is going to drive even greater business efficiency in the future. So we're bullish on Microsoft. And, and you're uh, just quickly, 20 seconds here, you're comfortable with the levels? I mean, it had quite a run last year. It had quite, quite a long run there, Carol, but I think what we're what the market's having a hard time catching up to right. is what we thought would take a couple of years or in a decade happened literally in a year yeah. you know, with the migration to the digital world. Yeah, I it, think Microsoft is in the center of that. Yeah, there's those companies that, you know, are in the spot of, right, as things, you know, pick up a lot of momentum in terms of those changing trends, if they're in the right place, right, they're just going to benefit from it. Yeah, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, Netflix. Right, right those momentum, you know, plays that everybody gets a little concerned about. All right, Ron Carson, thank you so much, CEO of Carson Group, uh, on the phone from Scottsdale, lovely Scottsdale. This is Bloomberg.
sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business App, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm John Tucker, the Bloomberg Newsroom, with this Bloomberg Business Flash. Thanks, Carol and Tim. You heard the uh, closing bell at the New York Stock Exchange. And as stock settles, it looks like everything's going to settle. The major averages all lowered today. Dow Jones Industrial Average at the close down 145 points. The S&P 500 down 31. Hand the NASDAQ Composite Index 230 points lower. Losses in tech shares accelerated near the close of regular trading. After the biggest rally in nine months, yesterday, technology shares leading the losses in the S&P 500. Yet giants Apple and Tesla dragging down the NASDAQ 100. In fact, Tesla tumbling more than 4% in today's trading. You also have bullishness among Wall Street strategists approaching levels that uh, presage potential trouble for stocks. This according to strategist at Bank of America Corporation. David Costin, chief strategist at Goldman Sachs, says the reopening of America is underway and it will power earnings eventually higher. Last month, last three months, you've had 10 of the 11 sectors have had positive earnings revisions. And that, in my view, is what's leading the market higher. Our forecast, $181 of earnings for this year, that's about 7% higher than consensus. We think there's room for upward earnings revisions. That's what's taking us higher. Okay, and some breaking news crossing the Bloomberg as uh, the close of regular trading on the New York Stock Exchange continues. The New York legislature has reached a deal to repeal Governor Cuomo's powers in the wake of uh, sexual harassment allegations against the governor. Icon Health and Fitness exploring an initial public offering that could value the exercise machine maker at more than $7 billion. And that is according to people familiar with the matter Icon makes, among other things, Nordic Track. Again, recapping the Dow, down 145, S&P 500 down 31, the NASDAQ down 230. I'm John Tucker. Oh, yeah, what I say. Nobody move a muscle. Bloomberg Business Week. Movers and shakers. Damn, Stippy, you got the move. On Bloomberg Radio. All right. You are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carl Master along with Tim Stanovic. We're waiting uh, a bunch of earnings, including a few retailers. Nordstrom, uh, HPE also expected to cross. Box as well, Urban Outfitters. So as soon as they do cross, uh, we will bring them to you. In the meantime, quick check on the trade today. John Tucker breaking down those closing numbers. 198 names in the S&P 500 higher today. 303 lower, four unchanged. Talk to us about those industry groups, Tim. Well, the industry groups show a lot of red materials. The only industry group in the green, higher by close to six-tenths of one percent. Uh, consumer staples down by uh, close to two-tenths of one percent. But look, if you're looking at the NASDAQ, this is no surprise to you. Information technology, as far as Bloomberg industry groups go, was the worst performer, down 1.6 percent followed by consumer discretionary lagging as well, down by 1.27%. All right, we do have some earnings crossing. I just want to bring them to you. Box uh, just crossing the Bloomberg terminal. And let me just pull up the numbers here. Uh, the company, fourth quarter adjusted EPS, 22 cents a share, uh, 5 cents a nickel better than what Wall Street was forecasting. Uh, fourth quarter revenue was also a slight beat, 198.9 million versus an estimate of 196.5. Taking a look at the outlook, they are upping their out look for first quarter revenue. Also, first quarter adjusted EPS, 16 to 17 cents a share. The estimate is for 16 cents a share. And the stock, quick check, in the after hours, we're seeing shares of Box. Let me bring it up. Hmm, just up about 3%, Tim. Yeah, uh, Box first quarter revenue forecast meeting estimates. As you mentioned, fourth quarter revenue coming in above estimates, uh, 198.9 million, beating estimates by uh, of 196.5 million. I want to mention raw stores. That stock is down about 6.5% in the after hours. Also coming out with their latest earnings. Uh, fourth quarter EPS, $0.67 cents a share versus an, an estimate that was for a dollar a share. So they are missing by a big uh, margin there. Fourth quarter comp sales down 6% versus an estimate that was looking for about a 4.7% decline. That retail industry continuing to take a beating. Uh, I do want to bring in Bloomberg News Markets reporter Abigail Doolittle. Abigail, we've been talking a lot about retail today because we've been getting numbers. Um, but what have you been really focusing on uh, throughout your coverage of the markets today? 
What stands out the most at this point, Carol, really is uh, this bearish close because earlier in the day there was a point where it felt as though uh, a bit neutral, a tug of war between the bears and the bulls. And the bears, of course, have been dominating just a little bit over the last two weeks, the S&P 500 last week and the week before down. And then yesterday we had that monster rally, the best uh, day since June. And so, you know, it seemed likely that you we were set up for a showdown. Uh, and early on, again, it felt as though the bulls were going to try to take it. And, you know, on the close, you have uh, the sellers really uh, stealing the show with the near term downtrend very much in effect. Um, and as you and Tim have been talking about tech, really the big underperformer, that points to sensitivity around rates because, of course, rising rates bring into question valuation. But rates aren't higher today. So it just yeah. speaks to the continued nerves around that issue. Yeah, that's a really good point. If you look at the charts, um, a really good observation and smart observation, Abigail, that uh, those major equity averages just taking a leg down in the last half hour or so and finishing at the lows. You mentioned tech valuation. We watched some of those plays. Uh, HP Enterprise out with their earnings. And actually, a kick higher uh, in the after hours. That stock's up about 2.8%. And if we take a look at what we got from the company, HP Enterprise boosting its fiscal year adjusted EPS view to $1.70 to $1.88. The estimate was for $1.70. So, really giving some breath uh, to the upper range there as well. Sees uh, free cash flow uh, fiscal year $1.1 billion to $1.4. Had seen $900 million to $1.1 billion. So, Tim, it looks like they're upping a lot of their metrics there. Yeah. Yeah, some good numbers from HPE. Hey, Abigail, what's the story that the bond market is telling us right now? Uh, the bond market feels as though it's a little bit on pause, trying to figure out whether or not, uh, you know, folks, the investor, investors and traders have confidence in the Fed. Because, of course, last Thursday we had that massive backup in yields out of nowhere at one point, the 10-year yield above 1.6 percent. Now back down toward seemingly more, quote unquote, normal levels, <laughs> uh, right around 1.4 percent. But, you know, a couple of weeks ago, that would have seen super high. So that's the story. Are we seeing the healthy reflation that we've been talking about? all year, and it seems that we are, even though today we don't have the energy sector and banks higher. Uh, those are the best sectors on the year. And today, as you were mentioning, Tim, the one sector that is higher materials, that's a cyclical sector, up six-tenths of one percent, helped out by a lot of those uh, materials and chemical and paint companies. So that's certainly healthy. Um, but I think that there's this sense that you're going to see yields creep higher and folks wanting to know, is it the reflation that we believe we have, or are there going to be some sorts of si some sort of signs around uh, runaway inflation? And right. that is probably also spoken, again, by today's weakness in technology. Yeah, it's a good point. Like, you do wonder whether the bond market was just catching up with the enthusiasm mm -hmm. in the equity market, or if there's more room to head higher there, especially when it comes to yields. All right, Abigail, thank you so much. Bloomberg News Markets reporter Abigail Doolittle. Do you want to mention HPE settling down now, just up about one-third of one percent, and a headline crossing that the New York legislature reaching a deal to repeal New York Governor uh, Andrew Cuomo's power. So do you want to put that out to you? All right, you're listening to Bloomberg. All right, Dave, you're up. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Dave. Wilson, where are you? Wilson! Just what do you think you're doing, Dave? We're going for the price on Wilson. Open up the door, it's Dave. Who? Dave. Hey, Mr. Wilson! Hey, Dave Wilson. Come on in here and give us your stock of the day. That would be Switch. And uh, the company builds and operates computer data centers. It's involved with edge computing, which brings services closer to customers to increase efficiency. Switch was founded in 2000 and went public in 2017. The ticker is SWCH. The shares peaked on the first day of trading and tumbled as much as 74% through the end of 2018. Though they later rebounded, they've struggled to stay above the initial price of $17 each. Uh, Switch fell below $17 today after the company's results and outlook were disappointing. Fourth quarter revenue trailed analyst average estimate in the Bloomberg survey. This year's earnings and sales forecast also came up short. Switch said results would suffer because of moves by two unnamed customers toward the public cloud. That's where you find providers such as Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud. Switch also cited the construction delays related to the coronavirus pandemic. All this sent the shares to their biggest loss since November 2018. They fell more than 13 percent to close at $15.37. All right, stock now down about 6% this year. Switch, biggest loss in almost a year. Wow. Yeah, it's a big move. All right, Dave Wilson, thank you so much. Have a good evening. Let's get a check on World of National News over to Nancy Lyons in D.C. Hey, Nance. 
Hey, Carol, President Biden will be speaking in just a short time concerning a new partnership between drug makers. His administration says Merck will help produce rival Johnson & Johnson's newly approved coronavirus vaccine in an effort to expand supply more quickly. FBI Director Christopher Wray was in the hot seat today taking questions from senators over the Capitol riot. He says he was appalled by what happened on January 6th. That attack, that siege was criminal behavior, plain and simple, and it's behavior that we, the FBI, view as domestic terrorism. It's got no place in our democracy, and tolerating it would make a mockery of our nation's rule of law. Ray says they've already arrested 270 people in connection with the violence, and he says states have taken more people into custody. He says the FBI will not tolerate agitators and extremists who plan to commit violence. The Supreme Court heard arguments today on the legality of Arizona's voting rules that a lower court said disproportionately burdens minority voters. Lawyer Michael Carvin argued that it's unfair to make allowances, which garnered a response from Chief Justice John Roberts. Uh, you must rejigger every aspect of the time, place, and manner, from registration to election day to early voting, in order to maximize uh, minorities' participation. Why is that bad? Because it's the same kind of race-conscious activity of subordinating well, neutral is it, is it really? Is it maximizing participation or, or equalizing it? A ruling on the issue is expected in June. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. Back to you, Carol and Tim. All right. Appreciate that. Nancy Lyons there with the World and National News Update. I'm Carol Masser in our Interactive Brokers studio. Uh, we are expecting to hear from President Biden giving an update on the virus and vaccine. Specifically, we are expecting him to talk about Merck helping J&J's single-shot coronavirus, coronavirus vaccine. We're talking about uh, production of it specifically. But let's get some thoughts on kind of where we are, that news, our expected news. Bloomberg News Senior Health Science and Medical Technology reporter Michelle Cortez, she is one of our go-to voices on all things COVID-19. She's with us once again on the phone in Minneapolis. Michelle, nice to have you here. We are kind of looking ahead, expecting to hear from President Biden. What are you expecting to hear from the president? Well, what we're expecting the president to announce is that Merck is going to help Johnson & Johnson produce the coronavirus vaccine that just got clearance in the last couple of days. It, this is significant for a couple of reasons. One, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is going to be a great new option for many people in the U.S. and across the world. It's given just once, and it's looking like it might have fewer side effects in part because of the fact that it's only given that one time, just easier to get out there. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that we don't have a lot of it. So Merck recently had setbacks with its COVID uh, products, with its COVID vaccines, and so it's stepping up a known a vaccine manufacturer. Now, you said it's significant because um, it's a great vaccine, another vaccine, another tool for us. Um, what's the other reason? Oh, is it well, just that they're, oh, that they're going to work together? Right, that they're going to work together. And that it, so what we're going to get here is, you know, by far the most important thing is just volume. Got it. We need so many of these shots. <laughs> You know, 7.7 .7 billion, really, but you know, in the U.S., 330 million sooner rather than later, and um, and J and J just can't do it on its own. Michelle, explain something to me. And Tim and I talked about this earlier. How is it that J and J didn't produce more ahead of time? Well, this is just a, a challenge. I mean, it. it I there. This whole entire coronavirus outbreak just makes my head spin every single time. Like, on the day that it got approval, it sent out 4 million doses, right? People are like, why only 4 million? You know, I mean, it's just crazy the fact that, and, and by the end of the month, they're expecting to hit about 20 million. So, you know, certainly that's a huge number, but it has been a challenge making it. And, you know, supply chains are difficult, getting all of the products, the, um, the fill, facilities to put the product into each one of the vials and they also didn't know right away that it was going to work so they have been working on it for a while they have been working as quickly as they could but they didn't have all of the inputs that they knew that they were going to need i guess the expectation i guess we were trying to get our head around this whole idea that listen they knew it was coming um i guess early research showing that 
the expectation it would get approved and that wouldn't they just kick into high gears. But was it, was were any of the companies kind of holding back a little bit just to wait? Or I'm just trying to understand, you know, kind of why it wasn't all in or has it just been just such a such a massive effort and difficult effort that made it kind of impossible to be, you know, getting the vaccine together as well as ramping up your manufacturing at the same time? Right. It It is the latter. Johnson okay. & Johnson was working absolutely as quickly as they possibly could when it came to this vaccine. Not only that, they're selling the vaccine, you know, at essentially, you know, not, not literally cost, but pretty close to cost. They're not looking to make a big profit on this product. So this is really something that they are doing, you know, for the near term, right? Ultimately, they're hoping that we might have coronavirus circulating for a while and this will be an ongoing product for them and, and make money. They are a uh, you know, a com- publicly traded company, and they're you know technically working for investors. But um, but this is not something that they were kind of trying to gamesmanship, or you know, they don't want to go too far down this path financially without knowing that they're going to get a return. This is just truly an issue of manufacturing when it comes to this scale and this type of a product is simply difficult. I appreciate you t- saying that because I think there's a lot of us just trying to understand it, and it is an impressive to to be quite honest. Here we are a year later. It's pretty impressive that we've got three vaccines vaccines and counting, and if not more, if you take into AstraZeneca and their efforts and, and, and there's more being worked on. What is it that you're going to be listening for when the president speaks specifically? We're obviously going to get this headline. It's pretty much well telegraphed out there in terms of Merck uh, working with J&J on boosting the output of, their vac- of the J&J vaccine. But what else do you want to hear from him at this point you know, how many days into his presidency and his administration in terms of where we are with handling this pandemic? Well, absolutely. There's a couple of different things that that, that you're asking about here. When it comes to the vaccines, it's all about the numbers at this point. The thing that everybody is talking about now, the things that Americans are feeling is when are we going to get them and what's going to happen for this, you know, supply chain, the you know, access that there is this concern about, you know, we want it and we want it now. What public health officials are worried about when it comes to these vaccines is that that stop gap is going to get unplugged here in the very near future mm-hmm. and we will get a flood of vaccines. So what they're talking about and worrying about is what do we need to do to make sure that everybody else in the U.S., you know, when you get beyond the the 30% to 50% of people who really are very anxious and eager to get it, how are we going to get that back end of people, maybe those who are a little bit more concerned about the the any kind of complications from vaccines, which have been very safe, but people who are just hesitant, how are we going to get them on board? So that's, of course, the, the vaccine piece. But the other thing, the bigger thing I think that's happening right now is this tension between opening up and letting people start returning to some degree of normalcy as we're seeing cases come down, as we're seeing deaths and hospitalizations come down, some worrisome numbers on cases rising. But, you know, we're so much better than we were. We're seeing things like, you know, Texas is removing its mask mandate. You know, there is definitely tension happening in this country, and we need to continue all moving in the same direction for just a few more months here so we can truly put it behind us. Otherwise, we risk throwing it all out. Well, the point is, too, right, it's all about, you know, getting to this herd immunity, right, to basically kind of shut down the virus from having any real hosts to kind of do its thing. And I do wonder when you, you know, see... As you said, Texas opening up. I've got a lot of family in Texas, uh, and maybe removing, you know, their mask mandate. And and as you said, there's this l- incredible pressure to reopen. Um, I was reading about was it the CDC maybe talking about the possibility of a fourth wave. I mean, these are are real possibilities still. They're real possibilities, and the thing is, I think a lot of people don't realize is that we're at a very delicate process. We're at a very delicate stage in the outbreak cycle. So what's happening now for the first time is that the virus is seeing people who have been previously exposed via vaccine. So all a virus does is it just tries to survive. That's all it does. And the only tool it has is this mutation tool. So it can change itself in order to help stay alive. And so as it's running into more and more and more people that have some degree of immunity and antibodies from being previously vaccinated, that virus is going to try to change 
specifically to address that vaccination immunity piece. And that's not happened before. So the more transmission that we get in this moment, the more time that virus hits somebody who has existing antibodies, the more risk that a deadly mutation will arise that will evade the antibodies, it will increase transmission, and it will be more virulent and cause more deaths and hospitalizations. And that's the piece that we need to avoid. Even when things seem like they're getting better right now, we're really at a very, you know, Right, and we know, and, and we know those numbers can quickly go. You know, can can spike very, very quickly. Um, Michelle, you know what's interesting too is we're seeing signs of, as you said, this push to reopen the economy. Lyft just reported its earnings stocks up about four point three percent here in the after hours. The company seeing three straight months of average daily rideshare ride growth. Their first quarter adjusted EBITDA loss was uh, one hundred thirty five million, less than what the street was expecting. So we are seeing. We we look at these companies. We listen to the CEOs about kind of the economy opening up their expectations. And I think so many people are talking about a second half of 2021 where we see the world reopening. Based on your reporting, based on what you're hearing, how do you see it? You know, honestly, my fingers are just crossed. I do think that's absolutely within the realm of possibility. There is no doubt about it. The vaccines that we have right now do appear to still be potent, even against these variants that we have seen, the one from South Africa, the one from Brazil, the one from the UK, even the new ones that are emerging in New York and California. There hasn't been anything that's catastrophically increasing. The concern is, of course, what I was talking about earlier, mm-hmm. that the virus does learn to mutate around the existing antibodies that we're getting from the vaccines. And that's what happened with the Spanish flu. That's why that went so badly. Does it always go that way or not necessarily? Because I think about, right, there's lots of viruses out there in terms of mutations. There are lots of viruses out there in terms of mutation, and not every mutation is necessarily worse, right? There are certainly some mutations that crop up that that make the virus go away more quickly or make it less likely to, to penetrate a healthy cell. Of course, those variations are the ones that go by the wayside very quickly, and it's those that are healthier that have you know, more sustainability that are able to to stick around longer. What worries you more? What worries you more, Michelle, the prospect of schools opening up versus sports arenas opening up? Oh, you know what, Michelle, forgive me. We're going to actually head to the White House because the president is getting ready to make some comments. Let's take you to Washington and President Biden. And uh, I'd like to make two uh, key announcements today related to our COVID-19 vaccination effort. As you know, a few days ago, after a rigorous opening, uh, open and objective scientific review process, the Food and Drug Administration issued an emergency use authorization for the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine. We should all be encouraged by this news of a third safe and highly effective COVID-19 vaccine. The more people who get vaccinated, the faster we're going to overcome this virus and get back to our loved ones, get our economy back on track, and start to move back to normal. But that's one of my first goals in office was, when I got in office, was to say that there will be 100 million vaccination shots administered in my first 100 days in office. We've got halfway to that goal in 37 days, and I feel confident we'll make it all the way. As as I've said, uh, we have a long way to go, but You know, as I said from the outset, we're going to use every resource of the federal government to make it happen. Among the things I learned when I came in office was that Johnson & Johnson was behind in manufacturing and production. While we we had the potential of another highly effective vaccine to accompany the two existing vaccines, it simply wasn't coming fast enough. So my team... Uh, my team has been hard at work to accelerate that effort. As uh, I've always said, this is a wartime effort, and every action has been on the table, including putting together breakthrough approaches. And today, we're announcing a major step forward. Two of the largest healthcare and pharmaceutical companies in the world that are usually competitors are working together on the vaccine. Johnson & Johnson and Merck will work together to expand the production of Johnson & Johnson's vaccine. This is the type of collaboration between companies we saw in World War II, 
We also invoked the Defense Production Act to equip two Merck facilities to the standards necessary to safely manufacture the J&J vaccine. And with the urging and assistance of my administration, Johnson & Johnson is also taking additional new actions to safely accelerate vaccine production. Johnson & Johnson's vaccine manufacturing facilities will now begin to operate 24-7. In addition, we'll continue to use the Defense Production Act to expedite critical materials in vaccine production, such as equipment, machinery, and supplies. I've also asked the Department of Defense to provide daily logistical support to strengthen Johnson & Johnson's efforts. And I want to thank Johnson & Johnson and Merck for stepping up and being good corporate citizens during this national crisis. Here's what all this means. We're now on track to have enough vaccine supply for every adult in America by the end of May. Let me say that again. When we came into office, the prior administration had contracted for not nearly enough vaccine to cover adults in America. We rectified that. About three weeks ago, we were able to say that we'll have enough vaccine supply for adults by the end of July. And I'm pleased to announce today, as a consequence of the stepped-up process that I've ordered and just outlined, this country will have enough vaccine supply, I'll say it again, for every adult in America by the end of May. By the end of May. That's progress, important progress. But it's not enough to have the vaccine supply. We need vaccinators, people to put the shots in people's arms, millions of Americans' arms. To date, we brought back retired doctors and nurses. We've developed, we deployed more than 1,500 federal medical personnel, you usually see during national disasters, from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, and the Commissioned Health Corps at the Department of Health and Human Services and the Defense Department, including the National Guard, with thousands more to come. We're also increasing the places where people can get vaccinated. We've sent millions of vaccines to over 7,000 pharmacies to make it easier for folks to get their COVID-19 vaccine shot like they would their flu shot. The federal government is also working with states to set up hundreds of mass vaccination centers in places like stadiums, community centers, parking lots that vaccinate thousands of people per day. My wife Jill and I just visited one in Houston last week. It's incredible. And with this increased production of three safe and effective vaccines, we have an opportunity to help address the urgent national need more quickly and getting our schools back open safely. Right now, an entire generation of young people is on the brink of being set back a year or more in their learning. You can ask millions of parents. They understand. We're already seeing rising mental health concerns due in part to isolation. Educational disparities that have always existed grow wider each day that our schools remain closed and remote learning isn't the same for every student, as you all know. Our educators are doing everything they can to protect and educate our students despite the lack of resources and as district face budget crises that risk education jobs. Moms and dads are exiting the workforce in astonishing numbers in order to care for and manage the school experience for their children at home, hindering their own opportunities for, for, and further undermining the health of our economy. This is a national imperative that we get our kids back into the classroom safely and as soon as possible. As you know, back in December, I set a goal for having a majority of our K-8 through schools open by the end of my first 100 days as president. To achieve that goal, I sent the American Rescue Plan to Congress to provide vital help to make sure schools can open safely, reopen safely. Essential things like more teachers to reduce class sizes, more buses and bus drivers to transport our kids safely, and more space to conduct in-person instructions and more protective equipment, school cleaning services, physical alterations to reduce the risk of the spread of the virus, all cost money. The House passed the American Rescue Plan last week. 
And I hope the Senate will follow as quickly and as well. You know, also the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, issued new guidelines on how to re reopen our schools safely. It's a roadmap that will enable schools, if they have the resources they deserve, to reopen safely. I have given those schools a roadmap. I've asked Congress to give them the tools. And today, to add one more tool to school reopening, a vaccinated workforce. Let me be clear. We can reopen schools if the right steps are taken, even before employees are vaccinated. But time and again, we've heard from educators and parents that have anxieties about that. So as yet another move to help accelerate the safe reopening of our schools, let's treat in-person learning like an essential service that it is. And that means getting essential workers who provide that service, educators, school staff, child care workers, get them vaccinated immediately. They're essential workers. Over 30 states have already taken the step to prioritize educators for vaccination. And today, I'm using the full authority of the federal government. I'm directing every state to do the same. My challenge to all states, territories, and the District of Columbia is this. We want every educator, school staff member, child care worker to receive at least one shot by the end of the month of March. All right, we're having a little technical difficulty. Uh, President Biden speaking there at the White House and talking, uh, really, the key headline there is the president talking about that we will, the United States, have enough vaccines for U.S. adults for by the end of May. Let's take year. you back there. I want to be very clear. Not every educator will be able to get their appointment in the first week, but our girl, goal is to do everything we can to help every educator receive a shot this month, the month of March. I want to conclude with this. We're making progress from the mess we inherited. We're moving in the right direction. And today's announcements are a huge step in our effort to beat this pandemic. But I have to be honest with you, this fight is far from over. I told you I'd be straight up with you from the beginning. As I said many times, things may get worse again as new variants spread and as we face setbacks like recent winter storms in the Midwest and South. But our administration will never take this public health threat lightly. Though we celebrate the news of a third vaccine, I urge all Americans, please keep washing your hands. Stay socially distanced. Wear masks. Keep wearing them. Get vaccinated when it's your turn. Now is not the time to let up. I've asked the country to wear masks for my first 100 days in office. Now is not the time to let our guard down. People's lives are at stake. We have already, we have already, and I carry this in my pocket, lost more. As of today, we've lost more than 511,839 Americans as of today. It's got to stop. We need the United States Senate to follow the House and pass the American Rescue Plan. Because despite the optimism, without new resources, our entire effort will be set back. We need the resources of the American Rescue Plan, and we need it urgently. We need them expanding testing, ramp up vaccine distribution, fund FEMA and other federal vaccine efforts, and continue reimbursing states for their efforts. We need the resources to expand genomic sequencing to stay ahead of emerging variants, find the protective gear, transportation, staffing, and other costs required for school and business to open safely. We need to fund it. The bottom line is we need the American Rescue Plan now. Now. There is light at the end of the tunnel. But we cannot let our guard down now. We're sure that victory is inevitable. We can't assume that. We must remain vigilant, act fast and aggressively, and look out for one another. That's how we're going to get ahead of this virus, get our economy going again, and get back to our loved ones. So thank you, and please, please, it's not over yet. Great news, but stay vigilant. May God bless you, and may God protect our troops. Thank you all very, very much. 
All right, that was President Biden uh, at the White House on a day when we still see global virus cases passing 114.4 million deaths, exceeding 2.54 million uh, around the world. The key headline there from the president saying that we will have enough vaccines for U.S. adults uh, by the end of May, also directing states to prioritize teachers for vaccines and that every educator should get at least one shot by the end of March. The president saying that the government using the federal pharmacy program to prioritize those teachers specifically. And again, really saying that this is a wartime effort using the Defense Production Act where J&J &J and Merck will work together, Merck to help produce those J&J &J vaccines. But again, talking about collaboration, uh, certainly within the big pharma community. Still also saying we need vaccinators, talking about bringing back retired doctors, and also setting up massive vaccination centers uh, around the country. But again, that key headline, talking about having enough vaccines for every American by the end of May. All right, you are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. We did get uh, lift earnings after the closing bell. That stock up about 5% in the after hours on a day when we saw equities close at their worst levels of the day. Do you want to bring in our next guest? He is someone certainly familiar uh, to our audience. Michael Moe, co-founder of GSV Asset Management. He has written several books, including the Global Silicon Valley Handbook. He has invested his firm in Facebook, Twitter, Spotify, so many uh, well-known companies. His new book is called The Mission, How Contemporary Capitalism Can Change the World One Business at a Time. And he joins us on the phone uh, from California. Michael, it is great to have you back with us. How are you? And tell me about your world. Carol, it's great to be with you. Um, everything is, um, you know, still, you know, we're waiting to have things open up a little bit, but, um, you know, the, the world's moving ahead nonetheless. I mean, I think the, the acceleration to digital just is um, pretty stunning. Uh, but but um, listening to uh, President Biden and talk about being able to move forward with the, 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 the vaccine, um, that that's encouraging news as well. Well, and I think you and others, and your book really gets into this, you know, we are at this interesting time where so many trends, whether it's digitization and, and other trends, have been accelerated because of the pandemic. It's also a time, though, that we are spending a lot of money to help out the economy, and we can think about how to do it better. Can we make, you know, the world greener? Can we solve climate change at the same time? You write about better capitalism. What is better capitalism? Well, Essentially, you know, Adam Smith's Invisible Hand, which uh, created the, the concept of capitalism, uh, that invisible hand's broken. And we see that in a variety of ways. And that was certainly true before the pandemic that, that became more fractured during the pandemic. And yet we don't believe the, um, you know, the solution to this is to cut the hand off. It's really to, to fix it and fix it with um, an evolution which we call contemporary capitalism. That is, that we think that the great businesses of tomorrow will combine the ambition of a for-profit with the heart of a not-for-profit. It's this idea of multiple constituents, you know, so it's not just the, the, the shareholder, it's also the employee, it's the consumer, it's the community, it's the environment. Right. And, and, and at the center of all that is a company needs to have a sense of, of, of purpose and meaning to what they do. How is it different than, say, the conscious capitalism that John Mackey, co-founder CEO of Whole Foods, and, and a guest, too, on our program, has written about? What's different? Yeah, I'd say that, again, I, I love what he's done, and he's certainly an influence on our thinking. I think partly what we tried to do was both to put um, some, some – we, we have seven declarations in the book talking about, we think, uh, you know, principles – that companies that want to reflect this new contemporary capitalism um, should, should aspire to. We purposefully kept them as general because we think this is going to get um, evolved over time into more specific ways that the companies are able to reflect that you know their their purpose, their mean, their success is 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 driven by um, fundamentals that are beyond just you know making the most profit that they can in that quarter. 
Hey, Michael, sit tight for a second because I've got to do a little bit of news, but I, I want to continue our conversation. We're going to come back to Michael Moe, co-founder of GSV Asset Management. I mentioned he's written the Global Silicon Valley Handbook. We've talked about that on air before. His new book is called The Mission Corporation, How Contemporary Capitalism Can Change the World One Business at a Time. Uh, and it's a great read, and we're going to continue the conversation, get right back to it. Uh, I just want to point out I'm watching Lyft in the after hours. Stock is up about 5.3% this after the company after the closing bell reported a smaller uh, than forecast uh, loss for the first quarter. Just an EBITDA loss of $135 million versus uh, $146.3 was forecast for the company. So watching that. All right, also keeping an eye on World and National News over to Nancy Lyons in D.C. Hey, Nance. Hey, Carol. Well, you heard it here on Bloomberg. President Biden says a novel partnership between rival drug makers is making the country, is getting the country rather, closer to full protection from the coronavirus. He says Merck has agreed to help produce the new Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And I want to thank Johnson & Johnson and Merck for stepping up and being good corporate citizens during this national crisis. Here's what all this means. We're now on track to have enough vaccine supply for every adult in America by the end of May. That's two months earlier than previously announced. The U.S. is joining the EU in sanctioning Russia over human rights abuses. State Department spokesman Ned Price explained why the actions are being taken. Today, the Department of State joined Treasury and Commerce in a coordinated whole-of-government action against Russian government entities and Russian officials for attempting to assassinate opposition figure Alexei Navalny with a chemical weapon in Russia in August of 2020 and for his subsequent arrest and imprisonment. The U.S. is also demanding the release of Navalny and his allies. New York legislative leaders have agreed to curb emergency powers granted to Governor Andrew Cuomo. It's a rebuke to allegations of sexual harassment against the governor. More are speaking out about the scandal, including Senator Elizabeth Warren, who tells Bloomberg's Kevin Cirilli she's confident the situation will be handled. Governor Cuomo needs a full, independent investigation, and I think the attorney general has that in mind. You can hear more of Kevin's interview with Senator Warren right here tonight at 5 Wall Street time on Bloomberg Sound On. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts from more than 120 countries. All right, Nance, thank you so much. Just want to update what I said about Lyft. They actually reported their earnings on February 9th, and we got those numbers back then. This is just an update on their financial picture, uh, talking specifically about their first quarter adjusted EBITDA loss, $135 million, uh, better than uh, an estimated loss of 146.3, stock rallying up more than 5% in the after hours. So we're watching that. Uh, we've also been watching uh, commercial real estate big time, and we had a great guest yesterday, Kent Swig. He's a real estate developer, uh, doing commercial and residential projects. He's president of Swig Equities. We talked about a lot of things, and specifically we talked about, he was responding to what Jamie Dimon had to said about hybrid working and working from home. And Ken Swig talks about whether work from home, that trend will have a lasting impact on commercial real estate. Check it out. I don't know that it's going to translate directly into into a less amount of office space being occupied. Um, so whereas people, uh, there was Stanford University did a study uh, uh, just before COVID, um, which was interesting, saying that about 29% of the people said of the workforce around the United States said they would be interested in working from home one day a week. Mm -hmm. And there was about 35% that said not a chance. Um, that, I think, would be very interesting to see where we are today, certainly. Right. Um, but I think one day a week, somewhere in there, people will be working from home. I think it's somewhat efficient to do that. Again, if you have a lot of emails one day and you want to work from home and answer them and not have right. office distraction, yes, it's good. All right, and that was Ken Swig. He is the president of Swig Equities on our latest Bloomberg Business Week podcast, which you can find at Bloomberg.com. Listen to that entire conversation where he talks about, uh, as you just heard, about going back to work, working from home, the hybrid mode uh, when we get on the other side of the pandemic. But he specifically also gets into what he's seeing in New York, specifically distressed investing, because we know there's a lot of private equity money, kind of dry powder, just waiting potentially to put that money to work. He also talks about Silicon Valley in California specifically, what we're seeing there in terms of trends when it comes to commercial real estate. So check it out again at our Bloomberg Business Week podcast. You're listening to Bloomberg Radio. And be sure to catch Sound On with Kevin Cirilli coming your way at 5 p.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg. Kevin, catching up with Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren. That's today. 
Sound on at 5 on Bloomberg Radio. All right, 445 on Wall Street. That means it's time for Land Rover Drive Time Traffic. We do it every 15 minutes. Brought to you by your Tri-State Area Land Rover retailers. Land Rover above and beyond. Ed Kulegi, Southern State Parkway. What do you see? Harold, there's an accident on the Southern State Parkway eastbound by the Wontaw. One lane is blocked 15 minutes back from Belmore Avenue. Back to the five boroughs we go. Queens, the Cross Island Parkway southbound at Hillside Avenue. An accident has traffic slow off the Grand Central. Manhattan, a very slow ride. Both sides of town all the way on up to the George Washington Bridge. Ten minutes outbound of the Holland Tunnel right now. Still 25 in for both approaches due to construction. Ten out of five in at the Lincoln Tunnel, George Washington Bridge. In and of itself, not bad. 40 minutes on over the Cross Bronx Expressway in towards the bridge. Looks like the ride in New Jersey, 280 westbound. A heavy ride, very slow right now. Coming out of Harrison into Newark, Bloomberg, 11303 day weather. Tonight, clear low 25 to 30. Wednesday, sunshine, high 45 to 50. Thursday, sunny, breezy, high 40 to 45. Then Friday, mostly sunny, high 35 to 40. Right now in Central Park, skies are for the most part clear. Temperature 35 degrees. This report sponsored by Rocket Mortgage. Want to see your loan options? Adjust payments and closing costs online in real time. Rocket can. When you need certainty in the home buying process with a loan that fits your life, Rocket can. Rocket Mortgage. With the best ride in and out of the city, I'm Ed Kalegi. This is Bloomberg 1130. Bloomberg Business Week continues. Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Hey, Anton John Tucker, the Bloomberg Newsroom with this Bloomberg Business Flash. U.S. stocks are pulling back from the biggest daily rise in almost nine months. The S&P 500 closing down today about to eight-tenths of a percent. This comes a day after the Blue Chip Index, best performance since the month of June. The uh, tech-focused Nasdaq dropping 1.7 percent, falling back from a 3 percent rally yesterday. Uh, some of Wall Street's high flyers led the decline today. The electronic car maker, the electric car maker, Tesla sliding 4.5%. Uh, shares in the streaming tech provider Roku tumbling 7.3%. The video conferencing platform Zoom down 9% by the time the closing bell rang. And uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average closing down 144 points, ending the day at 31,391. S&P 500 down 31 points at 3870. The Nasdaq down 230 points, 1.7% uh, decline, finishing the session at 13,358. Carol Warner Brothers Interactive Entertainment and developer Alvin Lanch Software 
are scheduling to release the uh, latest Harry Potter video game. This will allow transgender characters. Very interesting story here on the Bloomberg today. I think it's great. J.K. Rowling has been in a bit of a, a, a trouble. Pickle? A sort of a transphobic, so uh, yeah. maybe they're trying to make up for this. Here I was still trying to grapple with the uh, Mr. Potato Head news. Oh, listen, that just blew my mind. What did we just call him? Hey, Potato? <laughs> I was way ahead of the curve as a kid. I used a real potato. <laughs> Isn't that how you're supposed to do? You're just old enough that you remember you singing a real <laughs> potato. <laughs> he was gender-free at the time. <laughs> That's right. He was just a spud. All of us were just a spud. Um... Thank you so much, John Tucker. I really appreciate it. Hey, I want to get right back to Michael Moe, co-founder of GSV Asset Management. He's got a new book out, uh, The Mission Corporation, How Contemporary Capitalism Can Change the World One Business at a Time. Still with us on the phone from Silicon Valley. So, uh, Michael, reading in and prepping for uh, our conversation today, I was thinking, all right, so how does China complicate this process of kind of a better Capitalism, because don't you need global cooperation in order for it to really work on all levels? Yeah, I mean, again, I think the forces at work here are human forces, and it, and it's it's gravity. And so, as much as China has um, its own hybrid form of capitalism, mm. you know, uh, Chinese capitalism. I mean, there's there's you know, people are people around the world. And what people are seeking, and, the, and whether they say it this in an articulate way or not, is people are looking for purpose. They're looking for meaning in their life and their work. And so people being inspired or happy, you know, 70% of employees either um, don't like their work or are neutral towards their work. And you look at the research, the science behind that, there's two reasons for that. Is they don't feel like they're their position matters. I mean, they don't have a purpose to what they're doing Mm -hmm. and they don't think their company has a purpose to what they're doing. Or if they do, it's not well articulated and they don't feel like they're part of that team. And so, I mean, that's just a fundamental reality. You you can create different. Did we lose Michael? Michael, you're frozen. Uh, we're we're gonna see. We, I'm sorry. Oh, I don't there, know where you lost me. No, we got gotcha. you. So, okay, so you're talking about people and the importance of you know what basically what their work is about. Yeah, I mean, people are seeking meaning and purpose, right? And, and that that's that, that I think is what drives motivation, and that's going to be true whatever the political system is. No, it's listen. You know, I have a lot of conversations with my younger nieces and nephews, and even my own daughter, who's you know a teenager, and they really care about this stuff in terms of what companies and you know leaders stand for. I do wonder too, though, how does you know we live in certainly my world is a publicly you know held market world <laughs> where i know we we keep hearing conversations about multiple stakeholders and i do wonder about it you know if if every multiple stakeholder is as important as the other but does the public markets complicate this idea of better capitalism or profit with a purpose i know it doesn't have to but i just wonder how it complicates it well, I think it ultimately will be reflected in multiples paid for companies that have sustainable values to their business model. Mm-hmm. So you might be able to make more money this quarter because you were able to do shortcuts or make decisions that um, might benefit the, the, the near-term numbers. But the multiple that investors are going to put on that, in my view, um, is going to be lower. And you're starting to see this shift. Is really taking, I mean, this kind of river of business is flowing in a different way than it's ever flowed before. And so as you talk about young people, you talk about your daughter and your, and your uh, nieces and nephews. I mean, this is, a, this is a phenomena that's really embedded in you know, what people you know, are looking for and what they want. And that ultimately, ultimately, all companies are valued the same way, which is future cash flows discounted back to the day. Companies that have these mission-driven values are really, you know, that, that really equates to more of a sustainable growth, more sustainable business model which should mean that their future profits are going to be greater, which means that, you know, that what, well, how the market ultimately values those should be higher. Well, and it's interesting, too, because when I talk to, you know, I, you mentioned my nieces and I mentioned my nieces, and, you know, there is a feeling that capitalism is bad. And, you know, I, I try to remind them that it builds a lot of things that we take for granted today. Um, you know, what is your... What would be your mes- message to someone if they're saying, listen, capitalism just doesn't work anymore? Yeah, I mean, again, young people were 60% plus in 
believe that socialism is a better system than capitalism. It's not that they're ignorant or that they don't know history. What they've experienced is a system that feels rigged. You see growing inequality. You see where, you know, the people running companies have made, you know, the you know, average CEO makes 400 times the average worker. And fewer and fewer people feel like they're getting a fair system. Today's world, basically your future depends on, well you, on how well you select your parents, mm -hmm. which is not, that's not a fair system. So people are looking for a, a better system. And that's what we're saying. You can't, you know, socialism is, is 0 and 42. So we know that. <laughs> so it's really how do you, as I said before, how do you fix the invisible hand of capitalism that's broken right. and make it better and make it reflect where this world's going? So what's out there on the horizon that gives you hope, whether it's leaders, whether it's companies, whether it's the younger generation that gives you hope that capitalism can be better? Well, I, I, I think you do see it in the young entrepreneurs and what they are doing in terms of the businesses they're creating. It's not just how can they get rich. In fact, most of them are saying, how can they dent the universe for good? How can they change the world for good? You talk about Lyft as a company that you know, had uh, you know, good numbers to report um, you know, in interim. And the stock reflecting that. Well, the fact is Lyft as a company has embedded values that I think uh, reflect a lot of what we talk about in contemporary capitalism. This mm -hmm. whole vaccine, this last 12 months of what we've gone through, this race to create a vaccine, which is just extraordinary what's happened. This is cooperation between big pharmaceutical companies, which aren't exactly the most loved, you know, and they're not the best behavior even. Right. But all of a sudden, it was sort of this kind of rallying for good, for doing, making the society better, not not from how they make more money. You know, so that, I think those kind of signs are encouraging. Hey, listen, just got about 30, 40 seconds here, just quickly, Michael. If there was one government policy, I know you talk about, you know, better tax incentive structures. If there's one policy that could come down that would really make a difference here, uh, what would it be? And just quickly, if you could. Yeah, I think it's it's you know it's it's it removing friction mm -hmm. from the the whole startup ecosystem, and I think it really it's embedded more than just tax policy. It's liberating companies to, to tack big problems and have investors support those problems that they're going to make the world better. So whether that's healthcare, whether that's education, right. whether that's the environment and climate, I and mean, we can we can we can create the incentives. To, to see, see the resources and, and, and focus developed there. I always feel inspired, Michael. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Michael Moe, co-founder of GSV Asset Management. Check out his book, The Mission Corporation, How Contemporary Capitalism Can Change the World One Business at a Time. All right. He's definitely looking at the world of Washington. Kevin Cirilli coming up with Sound On. What do you got? You got a big interview, kiddo. Elizabeth Warren. Wow. Senator Elizabeth Warren talking a lot about those capitalism themes. Yeah, exactly. And I saw a lot of headlines crossing. Listen, have a great show. Looking forward to it. Sound on with Kevin Cirilli is coming up. Have a great evening, everyone. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Business Week brought to you by Audi. Don't let someone else drive off in the Audi model you've always wanted. Visit a tri-state Audi dealer to get behind the wheel of yours today. This is 458, 458, let's try that again, on Wall Street. It is time for Land Rover Drive Time Traffic, brought to you by your Tri-State Area Land Rover retailers. Land Rover above and beyond. All right, Ed Kalegi, Route 80 in New Jersey. How's it going? Well, right now, Carol, 80, not one, but two accidents slowing traffic. The first one on the westbound side is by exit 56. The other is out by exit 30 near Howard Boulevard in Mount Arlington, and that's causing about a 